In case anyone missed the previous two threads, just a heads up, most of this stuff may be considered TL, DR for many people. If this is your cup of whatever you drink, then hop aboard the weirdness train. Starting with a well-known classic to get the ball rolling. The Jersey Devil, the supposed mythical creature of the New Jersey Pinelands, has haunted New Jersey and the surrounding areas for the past 260 years. This entity has been seen by over 2,000 witnesses over this period. It has terrorized towns and caused factories and schools to close down, yet many people believe that the Jersey Devil is a legend, a mythical beast, that originated from the folklore of the New Jersey Pine Barrens. Others disagree with this point of view. The following text will show there is evidence to support the existence of an animal or supernatural bring known as the Jersey Devil. The evidence consists of the stories of the Jersey Devil's origin, the sightings of it, and finally, the theories on it. There are many different versions of the birth of the Jersey Devil. One of the most popular legends says a Mrs. Shrouds of Leeds Point, New Jersey made a wish that if she ever had another child, she wanted to be a devil. Her next child was born misshapen and deformed. She sheltered it in the house, so the curious couldn't see him. On stormy night, the child flapped its arms, which turned into wings, and escaped out the chimney and was never seen by the family again. A Mrs. Bowen of Leeds Point said, the Jersey Devil was born in the Shrouds house at Leeds Point. One another story that also placed the birth at Leeds Point said that a young girl fell in love with a British soldier during the Revolutionary War. The people of Leeds Point cursed her. When she gave birth, she had a devil. Some people believe the birth of the devil was punishment for the mistreatment of a minister by the Leeds folk. Another story placed the birth in Estelville, New Jersey. Mrs. Leeds, of Estelville, finding out she was pregnant with her thirteenth child, shouted, I hope it's a devil. She got her wish. The child was born with horns, a tail, wings, and a horse-like head. The creature revisited Mrs. Leeds every day. She stood at her door and told it to leave. After a while, the creature got the hint and never returned. Burlington, New Jersey, also claims to be the birthplace of the Jersey Devil. In 1735, Mother Leeds was in labor on a stormy night. Gathered around her were her friends. Mother Leeds was supposedly a witch and the child's father was the devil himself. The child was born normal, but then changed form. It changed from a normal baby to a creature with hooves, a horse's head, bat wings, and a forked tail. It beat everyone present and flew up the chimney. It circled the villages and headed toward the pines. In 1740 a clergy exorcised the devil for 100 years and it wasn't seen again until 1890. There are many other versions of the legend. The legends say it was the 6th, 8th, 10th, 12th, or 13th child, it was born normal or deformed, and the mother confined it to the cellar or the attic. Although there are many discrepancies in all of these stories, there are three pieces of evidence that tie all of the legends of the Jersey Devil's origin together. The first thing that ties the legends together is the name Leeds. Whether the mother's name was Leeds or the birthplace was Leeds Point, all of the stories include the name Leeds. Alfred Heston, the Atlantic County historian, believes that the devil could be a Leeds or a Shrouds baby. He discovered that a Daniel Leeds opened land in Great Egg Harbor, New Jersey, in 1699. His family lived in Leeds Point. He also discovered a Samuel Shrouds, Sr. came to Little Egg Harbor, New Jersey, in 1735 and lived right across the river from the house of Mother Leeds. The third fact ties in the Burlington story with the other's stories. Professor Fred McFadden of Coppin State College, Baltimore, found that a devil was mentioned in writings from Burlington as early as 1735. He also indicated that the word Burlington was used to was the word used to names the area from the city of Burlington to the Atlantic Ocean. This means that the name that is now used for the birthplace such as Leeds Point or Estelville, could be the same place referred to in the Burlington legend. The origins provide some validity to the existence of the Jersey Devil, but the sightings are the most substantial pieces of evidence. The sightings have been divided up into three time periods, 
pre-1909, January 16 to 23, 1909, and post-1909. From the pre-1909 era, few documented records of sightings still exist. The ones that do confirm the existence of the devil. In the early 19th century, Commodore Stephen Decatur, a naval hero, was testing cannonballs on the firing range when he saw a strange creature flying across the sky. He fired and hit the creature but it kept right on flying across the field. Joseph Bonaparte, former King of Spain and brother of Napoleon, saw the Jersey Devil in Bordentown, New Jersey, between 1816 and 1839 while he was hunting. In 1840-41 many sheep and chickens were killed by a creature with a piercing scream and strange tracks. In 1859-94, the Jersey Devil was seen and numerous times and reportedly carried off anything that moved in Haddonfield, Bridgeton, Smithville, Long Branch, Brigantine, and Leeds Point. W.F. Meyer of New York noticed while visiting the Pine Barrens, most of the locals would not venture out after dark. The Devil was sighted by George Sorosi, a prominent businessman, at the New Jersey-slash-New York border. This was the last reported sighting before the turn of the century. In 1903, Charles Skinner, author of American Myths and Legends, claimed that the legend of the devil had run its course and that in the new century, New Jersey would hear no more of the devil. New Jersey rested easy with that thought for six years, until the week of January 16 to 23, 1909. During this week, the devil would leave his tracks all over South Jersey and Philadelphia. He was seen by over 1,000 people. This was his largest appearance ever. It all started early Sunday morning, January 16, 1909. Thack Cousins of Woodbury, New Jersey, saw a flying creature with glowing eyes flying down the street. In Bristol, PA, John Cowan heard and saw the strange creature on the banks of the canal. Patrol James Sackville fired at the creature as it flew away screaming. E.W. Minister, Postmaster of Bristol, PA, also saw a bird-like creature with a horse's head that had a piercing scream. When daylight came, the residents of Bristol found hoof prints in the snow. Two local trappers said they had never seen tracks like those before. On Monday, the Lodens of Burlington, New Jersey, found hoof prints in their yard and around their trash, which was half eaten. Almost every yard in Burlington had these strange hoof prints in them. The prints went up trees, went from roof to roof, disappeared in the middle of the road, and stopped in the middle of open fields. The same tracks were also found in Columbus, Heading, Kinhora and Rancocas. A hunt was organized to follow the tracks but the dogs wouldn't follow the trail. On the 19th the Jersey Devil made his longest appearance of the week. At 2.30 a.m., Mr. and Mrs. Nelson Evans of Gloucester were awakened by a strange noise. They watched the devil from their window for 10 minutes. Mr. Evans described the creature they saw. It was about 3 feet and half high, with a head like a collie dog and a face like a horse. It had a long neck, wings about 2 feet long, and its back legs were like those of a crane, and it had horse's hooves. It walked on its back legs and held up two short front legs with paws on them. It didn't use the front legs at all while we were watching. My wife and I were scared, I tell you, but I managed to open the window and say, shoo, and it turned around barked at me, and flew away. Tuesday afternoon two professional hunters tracked the devil for 20 miles in Gloucester. The trail jumped five foot fences and went under eight inch spaces. The hoof prints were found in more parts of South Jersey. A group of observers in Camden, New Jersey, saw the devil. It barked at them and then took off into the air. The next day, a Burlington police officer and the Reverend John Purcell of Pemberton saw the Jersey devil. Reverend Purcell said, never saw anything like it before. Three posses in Haddonfield found tracks that ended abruptly. In Collingswood, New Jersey, a posse watched the devil fly off toward Moorestown. Near Moorestown, John Smith of Maple Shade saw the devil at the Mount Carmel Cemetery. George Snyder saw the devil right after Mr. Smith and their descriptions were identical. 
in Riverside, New Jersey, hoof prints were found on rooftops and also around a dead puppy. On Thursday, the Jersey Devil was seen by the Black Hawk Social Club. He was also seen by a trolley full of people in Clementon as it circled above them. The witnesses' descriptions matched others from the days before. In Trenton, Councilman E.P. Wheaton heard the flapping of wings and then found hoof prints outside his door. The prints were also found at the arsenal in Trenton. As the day wore on the trolleys in Trenton and New Brunswick had armed drivers to ward off attacks. The people in Pittman filled churches. Chickens had been missing all week throughout the Delaware Valley, but when the farmers checked their yards that day, they found their chickens dead, with no marks on them. The West Collingswood Fire Department fired their hose at the devil. The devil retreated at first, but then charged and flew away at the last second. Later that night, Mrs. Sorbinski of Camden heard a commotion in her yard. She opened the door to see the Jersey Devil standing there with her dog in its grip. She hit the devil with a broom until it let go of her dog and flew away. She started screaming until her neighbors came over. Two police officers arrived at her house where over 100 people had gathered. The crowd heard a scream coming from Kagan Hill. The mob ran toward the creature on the hill. The police shot at it and the devil flew off into the night. The streets of Camden were empty after this. On Friday, Camden police officer Louis Strayer saw the Jersey Devil saw the devil drinking from a horse's trough. The school in Mount Ephraim was closed because no students came in. Mills and factories in Gloucester and Hainesport had to close because none of the employees came to work. Many New Jersey residents wouldn't leave their houses, even in daylight. Officer Merchant of Blackwood drew a sketch of the creature he saw. His sketch coincided with the descriptions from earlier in the week. Jacob Henderson saw the devil in Salem and described it as having wings and a tail. The devil was only seen once more in 1909 in February. Since 1909, the Jersey Devil has continued to be sighted by people all over New Jersey. The number of sightings that have been reported to the authorities has dwindled over the years. This could be attributed to the fact that people don't want to be branded as crazy. Even though the number of reported sightings has dropped, there's still a considerable amount of sightings in the post-1909 era. In 1927, a cab driver on his way to Salem got a flat tire. He stopped to fix the tire. As he was doing this, creature that stood upright and was covered with hair, landed on the roof of his cab. The creature shook his car violently. He fled the scene, leaving the tire and jack behind. Philip Smith, who was known as a sober and honest man, saw the devil walking down the street in 1953. The characteristic screams of the Jersey Devil were heard in the woods near Woodstown, New Jersey, in 1936. Around 1961, two couples were parked in a car in the Pine Barrens. They heard a loud screeching noise outside. Suddenly the roof of the car was smashed in. They fled the scene, but returned later. Again they heard the loud screech. They saw a creature flying along the trees, taking out huge chinks of bark as it went along. There have been other sightings since 1909, such as the invasion of Gibbsboro in 1951. The people there saw the devil over a two-day period. In 1966, a farm was raided and 31 ducks, 3 geese, 4 cats, and 2 dogs were killed. One of the dogs was a large German shepherd which had its throat ripped out. In 1981, a young couple spotted the devil at Atchin Lake in Atlantic County. In 1987, in Vineland an aggressive German shepherd was found torn apart and the body gnawed upon. The body was located 25 feet from the chain which had been hooked to him. Around the body were strange tracks that no one could identify. The sightings and prints are the most substantial evidence that exists. Many of the theories on the Jersey Devil are based upon that evidence. Some theories can be proven invalid, while others seem to provide support for the Jersey Devil's existence. One theory is that the Jersey Devil is a bird. Mrs. Cassidy of Clayton thought it was an invasion of scrofood ducks. The scrofood duck is much too small to be mistaken for the devil. 
Others believe the devil is really a sandhill crane. The crane used to live in South Jersey until it was pushed out by man. The sandhill crane weighs about 12 pounds, is 4 foot high, and a wingspan of 80 inches. It avoids man but if confronted it will fight. It has a loud scream hooping voice that can be heard at a distance. This could account for the screams heard by witnesses. The crane also eats potatoes and corn. This could account for the raids on crops. This theory doesn't explain, however, the killing of livestock. It also doesn't explain why people describe the devil as having a horse's head, bat wings, and tail, all of which the crane doesn't have. Professor Brawlhoff said that the tracks were made by some prehistoric animal from the Jurassic period. He believes the creature survived underground in a cavern. An expert from the Smithsonian Institute had a theory about ancient creatures surviving underground. He said the Jersey Devil was a pterodactyl. The Academy of Natural Sciences could find no record of any creature, living or extinct, that resembles the Jersey Devil. Jackie Boucher, author of Absagami Yesteryear, has a theory in which he believes the devil was a deformed child. He thinks Mrs. Leeds had a disfigured child and kept it locked away in the house. She grew sick and couldn't feed the child anymore. It escaped out of hunger and raided local farms for food. This doesn't take into account the incredible lifespan of the devil. The child would have been 174 years old in 1909. It also doesn't account for the sightings of the devil flying. Only a small amount of the sightings and footprints could be hoaxes. The Jersey Devil has been seen by reliable people such as police, government officials, postmasters, businessmen, and other people whose integrity is beyond question. As for the hoof prints, even if some were hoaxes, there is still no way to explain most of the tracks, especially the ones on rooftops and tracks that ended abruptly as if the creature took wing. The last theory is the most controversial one. Many people believe that the Jersey Devil could be the very essence of evil, embodied. It is said that the Devil is an uncanny harbinger of war. And appears before any great conflict. The Jersey Devil was sighted before the start of the Civil War. It was also seen right before the Spanish-American War and World War I. In 1939, before the start of World War II, Mount Holly citizens were awakened by the noise of hooves on their rooftops. The Devil was seen on December 7, 1941, right before Pearl Harbor was bombed. He was also seen right before the Vietnam War. The Jersey Devil's habit of being a forerunner to wars could be because of his possible demonic origins. In 1730, Ben Franklin reported a story about a witchcraft trial near Mount Holly, New Jersey. One of the origin legends say that Mother Leeds was a witch. The devil's birth could have been a result of a witch's curse. Other facts support the supernatural theory are the reports of the death of the devil. When Commodore Decatur fired a cannonball at the devil, it went through him and he was unaffected. In 1909, a track walker on the electric railroad saw the devil fly into the wires above the tracks. There was a violent explosion which melted the track 20 feet in both directions. No body was found and the devil was seen later in perfect health. In 1957, the Department of Conservation found a strange corpse in a burned out area of the pines. It was a partial skeleton, feathers, and hind legs of an unidentifiable creature. The devil was thought to be dead but reappeared when the people of New Jersey thought that this time his death was real. Each time he is reported dead, he returns. Sometimes this year. The Jersey Devil will be 260 years old. It seems the Devil is immortal, which a supernatural being would be. Another thing that supports this theory is the incredible distances the Devil could fly in a short period of time. No animal could travel as fast as the devil did in 1909 when he was sighted in South Jersey, Philadelphia, and New York throughout the week. None of these theories can give a definitive answer to what the Jersey devil was or is, but the sightings prove there is something out there. Whether the Jersey devil is a bird or a demon, is still left to speculation. The people of New Jersey have definitely seen something out there lurking in the Pine Barrens. Some sauce.
The Kelly Hopkinsville Goblins Encounter On the night of August 21, 1955, two Kentucky families claimed to have fought unknown beings. In a rural area of Kentucky, near Hopkinsville and Kelly, two families contend they battled extraterrestrial creatures. The event happened around the Sutton farmhouse, where the Suttons and the Taylors gathered for dinner. At some point during the evening, Billy Ray Taylor went outside to draw water from the well. Taylor witnessed a huge, bright object land in the woods about a quarter of a mile from the house. He started towards the house with the water when he saw a strange creature approaching. Billy Ray dropped the bucket and ran into the house. Both he and Lucky Sutton picked up firearms and ran back outside. Taylor fired his 22 caliber rifle and Lucky fired his shotgun but neither weapon had any effect on the creature. Sutton and Taylor described the aliens as three feet tall, with pointed ears, thin limbs, long arms, and claw-like hands. They said the creatures looked like gremlins, hence they became known as the Hopkinsville Goblins. The beings were either silvery in color or were wearing something metallic. The strangest aspect of these creature was their movements. The aliens' movements seemed to defy gravity as they floated above ground and walked with a swaying motion like they were walking through water. The two men returned to the house. However, another creature appeared at the window. He two families realized they were up against something extraordinary. They ran from the house, got in their cars and headed to Hopkinsville. There they sought help from police who followed them to the farmhouse and searched the area. Although they found no evidence of the creatures, they did find that the farmhouse had been shot up by the humans during the battle. The police left shortly after, but the aliens returned and the battle resumed. The defenders' guns continued to have no effect. The Air Force investigated the event but could not find solid evidence. At first, the public reaction was that the incident was a hoax. However, the Suttons and the Taylors never profited from the encounter and there were dozens of eyewitnesses to the event. In addition to the families at the farmhouse, there were law enforcement officers who saw strange lights in the sky. In 1957, Air Force Major John E. Albert concluded that the case resulted from the witnesses observing a monkey painted with silver that had escaped from a circus. French UFO researcher Renaud Glet opined that a pair of great horned owls may have been misidentified as aliens. However, Dr. J. Alan Hinek believed the incident was real. UFO researcher Alan Hendry wrote, His case is distinguished by its duration and also by the number of witnesses involved. Jerome Clark writes that, investigations by police, Air Force officers from nearby Fort Campbell, and civilian ufologists found no evidence of a hoax. Although they never formally investigated the case, Blue Book confessed to being stumped. So was Isabel Davis, one of the most skeptical of UFO investigators. Many of famed film director Steven Spielberg's projects, like Night Skies, E.T., and Gremlins, were directly inspired by the Kelly Hopkinsville events. Sources The Kroglin Vampire Legend Our modern idea of a vampire, a creature that has returned from death to prey on humans at night, is based on the Eastern European vampires' myths and legends, such as vampires wearing capes or turning into bats. Although vampire myths occur in almost every culture around the world, such myths are rare in England where the idea was almost unknown until the 18th century, when reports from Europe began to surface. This particular account dates from just after the English Civil War in the 1650s. The owners of Kroglin Low Hall in Cumberland, now Cumbria, were a family named Fisher and the story was told to one Augustus Hare by a descendant of the family in 1896. For some reason of their own, the Fishers decided to go and live in the south of England and rent out the farm. The new tenants were two brothers and a sister named Cranswell. The new family stayed in their remote farmhouse through the first winter without event. The summer came and, that year, it was stiflingly hot so they slept with the windows open. At that time the hall was only one story high, the upstairs has been built subsequently. Near the hall was a chapel and a small graveyard which once belonged to the Howard family, who were great landowners in these parts. 
One airless summer night the men sat with their sister watching the moon rise. After a time they decided to go to bed. The sister lay in her bed, the bedclothes cast off because of the heat. She had closed her window, but not fastened the shutters. She gazed out of her window, propped up on her pillows as the long summer day faded out and night took its place. In Cumbria at midsummer, because it is quite far north, it does not get very dark at all between sunset and sunrise. Miss Cranswell soon became aware of two lights in the belt of trees some distance from the house which separated the lawn from the graveyard. She watched and, after a while, she made out a dark shape moving towards the house and towards her window. A terrible horror seized her. She wanted to get up and leave the room, but to go to the door would have meant she had to go closer to the window. Besides she had locked the door from the inside and so would have to stand there and unlock it. All the while clearly visible to whatever was out there. Frozen to the spot, she stared at the shape. But then it turned and instead of moving closer to her window, it started to move around the house. She jumped up and ran towards the door. Her hands were shaking so much that she found it hard to turn the key. And then her heart nearly stopped. Behind her, close to her though she didn't dare look, she heard a scratching at the window. It was outside. Just feet away. She stood there petrified with fear still not turning her head. Then she heard the sound of it unpicking the lead which held the glass in place. She forced herself to look and saw that one pane of the mullionied glass had come away and a long bony hand stretched in and turned the window catch. Whatever it was, it came in through the window with a rush and grabbed her. Its fingers in her hair, its mouth at her throat. It bit her neck and forced her onto the ground. As it bit her she screamed. Her brothers heard the noise and came and battered at the locked door. The creature looked up as the door was broken open, it turned and fled out of the window, leaving her lying on the floor, bleeding profusely from a wound at her neck. One brother clambered out of the window and went after it. But it was fast and before he could catch it. Perhaps it was lucky for him that he didn't. It disappeared into the inky blackness around the graveyard. Trying to explain the incident afterwards, the girl rationalized that the creature must have been a dangerous lunatic. But she was still horribly shocked and her brothers took her away from Kroglin to recover. They stayed away for a while, but then, as autumn came, it was she who urged them to return to Kroglin. They had paid for the tenancy, and besides, she joked, it would be very bad luck to come across two escaped lunatics. They returned to Kroglin and spent the winter there. She had the same room, but always closed the wooden shutters. The brothers took to carrying loaded pistols with them around the house. But nothing happened until one night in March. The sister was lying in bed when she heard a terribly familiar scratching at the window. She struggled to get fully awake and scrabbled for a candle and something to light it with. When she got a flame she saw that the shutters were opened. Staring in at her was a brown shriveled face, she saw its long bony hands picking at the lead of the windows. This time she screamed immediately. Her brothers rushed in with their pistols. She pointed to the window, but the creature had gone. The brothers ran out of the front door and saw it moving across the lawn towards the graveyard. They fired and one of them hit it in the leg. It scrambled away into the darkness and they lost it. The next day the brothers summoned their neighbors, and with their help they went into the graveyard. The tenants of nearby Kroglin High Hall had also been suffering visits from it and their young daughter had bite wounds at the throat. The father had thought that she had been bitten by a rat, but when the Cranswell said what had happened to their sister, they feared the worst and the father joined the party as it made its way to the graveyard. One of the locals had heard rumors of a particular vault being home to some monster so they opened it up. They stood around, pistols and other weapons at the ready. The vault was full of coffins but most were smashed and the remains mangled and strewn across the floor. Only one coffin was undisturbed. They lifted the lid and there they saw the mummified and shriveled figure that had moved as if alive the night before. To confirm what they feared they looked at the leg and found a recent wound from a pistol ball. There and then they set fire to the dry coffin and burnt the vampire in it. 
In his book Ghosts and Legends of the Lake District, J. A. Brooks tells that in the early years of the century the tenants of Kroglin Low Hall had to deal with a fire in the dining room chimney. When the fire died down and they were rebuilding the chimney, they found an ancient burnt corpse in there. Though the tenant wanted to rebury the corpse in a churchyard with proper Christian rites, he died before he was able to do this. Some people think that the corpse is still there in the chimney. Augustus Hare, who had the story printed, said he heard it from a Captain Fisher who leased the property after the Cranswells. He dated the events to around 1875. This immediately aroused suspicion that he had actually adapted certain sequences in a penny dreadful novel possibly by James Malcolm Rymer, Varney the Vampire, or The Feast of Blood published in 1847. Penny dreadfuls were deliberately sensational. The book sold for a penny, often authors did not want to admit they wrote them. In 1924, Charles G. Harper decided to challenge Hare's account of the vampire. He went to Cumberland and could not find Kroglin Grange, although he found both a Kroglin High Hall and a Kroglin Low Hall. There was no church nearby. The closest was a mile away. There was no vault as described by the brothers and the villagers. Later a man called F. Clive Ross visited the area and in turn challenged Harper's findings. He interviewed the local people and deduced that Kroglin Low Hall was the Grange. He also noted that a chapel had existed near the house and its foundation stones were still there in the 1930s. Then in 1968, D. Scott Rogo, a writer, using a book published in 1929 that contained both stories concluded that it was likely that one story was based upon the other and therefore Kroglin Grange was most likely a hoax. However some years later F. Clive Ross found a witness, Mrs. Parkin who lived at Slack Cottage in Anne's Table who said she had known one of the Fishers. However this gentleman was born in the 1860s had heard the story from his grandparents. Mrs. Parkin also said that according to the deeds of Kroglin Low Hall, it was commonly called Kroglin Grange until 1720. When all else fails, you can always go to the pub. So Hare had made a huge blunder. If the story had taken place it was two centuries earlier in 1680 to 1700 not the 1870s. Clive Ross published his research in Tomorrow magazine, spring 1963. More recent research by Lionel Fantherp also suggests that the events took place in the late 1600s. A vault close to the Grange was demolished during Cromwell's time. Hence these findings, place the events before the publication of Varney the Vampire. So what exactly happened? We shall never know. It is possible that Varney's author heard the legend and decided to write about it as a penny dreadful. It was said the book was based on events that took place during the reign of Queen Anne, 1702-14, near the time of the incident. Maybe Hare used Varney the Vampire for his book or perhaps he heard about the legend independently and wrote his own account. Whatever the truth, the Kroglin Beast will remain a mystery. Sources The Pascagoula, Mississippi Alien Abductions, October, 1973 on the night of October 10, 1973, 15 different people witnessed a UFO over a housing project in St. Tammany Parish, New Orleans, Louisiana. Two of the witnesses were policemen. This sighting was only the beginning of what was to occur the next night on the nearby Pascagoula River. Two fishermen, 19-year-old Calvin Parker, and 42-year-old Charles Hickson were about to have an experience that would forever change their lives. Parker and Hickson were good friends, and often fished together. They were both living in the town of Gautier, Mississippi. On one particular night, they were fishing the waters of the Pascagoula River, when suddenly they heard a strange buzzing sound. The two men immediately turned to see what the source of the strange noise was. They were shocked to see an egg-shaped object with bluish front lighting. The object was only a few feet above the water, and about 10 yards from the two frightened fishermen. While they sat stunned, a door opened in the UFO and three beings of unknown origin began to flow toward the two. The beings did have legs, but did not use them. They literally floated across the water toward Hickson and Parker. 
The two fishermen would later attempt to describe what the beings looked like, saying, about five feet tall, had bullet-shaped heads without necks, slits for mouths, and where their noses or ears would be, they had thin, conical objects sticking out, like carrots from a snowman's head. Hickson sat frozen on the river bank. Suddenly, two of the odd-looking beings grabbed him, while the third being snatched Parker, who immediately fainted from fear. The being supported Hickson by literally holding up his body. As they did, he felt numbness over his entire body. By some power he could not see, he floated into the bowels of the object to a brightly lit room. The room had no gravity. He floated while a strange eye-like device moved over his entire body as if it was scanning him. After the eye-like device was finished with Hickson, he was left floating in the room alone. The beings had probably left to examine Parker. Approximately 20 minutes after the ordeal had begun, it was over. Hickson was now floated back out of the craft. Back on the river bank, he could see Parker, who was crying and praying on the ground. Shortly, the strange flying object rose straight into the night sky, and flew away. After collecting their senses and strength, they began to talk about what action they should take. At first they were afraid to report their experience, but they felt obligated to tell someone. What if these beings were taking other people in the area? Fighting fears of public ridicule, they called Kessler Air Force Base in Biloxi. They were instructed to report their incident to the local sheriff's department. Sheriff Fred Diamond thought their story was a hoax or trick. Trying to get to the bottom of their account, the two fishermen were placed in a room wired for sound. It was thought that they would discuss the joke between themselves, and their story would be found out. Instead, they continued to talk about the incident and seemed terribly distressed. Soon law enforcement personnel knew that something had certainly frightened Hickson and Parker, and that this was no joke. Very quickly, details of the alleged abduction began to leak out to the public. First, the account of the incident was published in local newspapers, soon followed by the wire services. In a matter of a couple of days, the Pascagoula, Mississippi, abduction was a big news item over the entire United States. Aerial Phenomena Research Organization APRO, sent University of California Professor James Harder to investigate the story. Dr. J. Allen Hinek, who represented the U.S. Air Force also would research the case. Harder and Hinek did a lot of the investigative work together. The two well-known researchers first interviewed the two fishermen together. Harder tried to do regressive hypnosis on Hickson, but the abductee was so frightened, that the hypnosis was stopped. To get things off on solid ground, both of the witnesses took polygraph tests, and both passed without a problem. Harder and Hinek both believed that the two tormented men were telling the truth. Esteemed UFO researcher J. Allen Hinek would proclaim that there was definitely something here that was not terrestrial. Even after 30 plus years, both Calvin Parker and Charles Hickson still testify to the same story, and have never wavered in their account of what happened that October night on the Pascagoula River. Sources The Secret Tape Sheriff Fred Diamond interviewed the men, who related their story. After repeated questioning, Diamond left the two men alone in a room that was, unknown to Hickson or Parker, rigged with a hidden microphone. Sheriff Diamond assumed that if they were lying, that fact would become immediately apparent when the two spoke privately. Instead, they continued to talk about the incident and seemed terribly distressed. This so-called secret tape was held on file at the Jackson County Sheriff's Department, and has since earned wider circulation amongst UFO researchers and enthusiasts. Parker, who seemed particularly shaken, spoke repeatedly of his wish to see a doctor. A partial transcript of their interrogation and of the secret tape is available, immediately below is part of the conversation on the secret tape, as transcribed by NACAP. Calvin, I got to get home and get to bed or get some nerve pills or see the doctor or something. I can't stand it. I'm about to go half crazy. Charlie, I tell you, when we through, I'll get you something to settle you down so you can get some damn sleep. 
Calvin, I can't sleep yet like it is. I'm just damn near crazy. Charlie, well, Calvin, when they brought you out when they brought me out of that thing, God damn it I like to never in hell got you straightened out. His voice rising, Calvin said, my damn arms, my arms, I remember they just froze up and I couldn't move. Just like I stepped on a damn rattlesnake. They didn't do me that way, sighed Charlie. Now both men were talking as if to themselves. Calvin, I passed out. I expect I never passed out in my whole life. Charlie, I've never seen nothing like that before in my life. You can't make people believe. Calvin, I don't want to keep sitting here. I want to see a doctor. Charlie, they better wake up and start believing, they better start believing. Calvin, you see how that damn door come right up? Charlie, I don't know how it opened, son. I don't know. Calvin, it just laid up and just like that those son bitches just like that they come out. Charlie, I know. You can't believe it. You can't make people believe it. Calvin, I paralyzed right then. I couldn't move. Charlie, they won't believe it. They gonna believe it one of these days. Might be too late. I knew all along they was people from other worlds up there. I knew all along. I never thought it would happen to me. Calvin, you know yourself I don't drink. Charlie, I know that, son. When I get to the house I'm gonna get me another drink, make me sleep. Look, what we sit in around for. I gotta go tell Blanche, what we wait in for. Calvin, panicky I gotta go to the house. I'm getting sick. I gotta get out of here. Then Charlie got up and left the room, and Calvin was alone. Calvin, it's hard to believe. Oh God, it's awful. I know there's a God up there. Seeing that the police were skeptical of their story, Hickson and Parker insisted that they take lie detector tests to prove their honesty. Antonio LaRubia Abduction Classification, HIN XEE4 Witness, Antonio LaRubia Time and Place, 2.20 AM, SEP 15, 1977 Paciencia, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil Entity Type, Lawson Robot Craft, 200 foot wide disc shaped craft Summary, a Brazilian man is abducted by robotic entities on September 15, 1977, a group of single-legged robots descended upon the village of Paciencia, Brazil, and subjected a 33-year-old bus driver to a terrifying ordeal. At 2.15 that morning, Antonio Larubia was walking to work when he saw an object like an enormous white hat sitting in a field. The object was 200 feet in diameter and dull gray in color. Larubia took one look at it and tried to run for his life but the disc fired a beam of blue light at him, instantly paralysing him. Simultaneously three bizarre robots silently materialized around him. The robots were constructed from a pattern of overlapping metallic scales. Each had an egg-shaped body with two tentacle-like arms and a single pedestal for a leg. Their rugby ball-shaped heads were topped by rapidly spinning antennae. One of the robots pointed a syringe-shaped device at La Rubia. Then the entire group floated towards the craft, together with the Brazilian. La Rubia could not remember how he entered the craft. But somehow he found himself standing alone in a white corridor. The outer wall was transparent, and through it he could see the ground falling away beneath him. Then a blue beam of light struck him, and he suddenly found himself in a circular white chamber. The chamber was occupied by two dozen robots identical to the ones that had captured him. They appeared to be silently communicating with one another. Who you are? What you want? La Rubia yelled at them. To his surprise, they promptly toppled over onto the floor. The Brazilian was temporarily blinded by a flash of blue light. When he recovered, he found that the robots had righted themselves. They were now gathered around a small instrument console which resembled an electric organ. 
As they manipulated keys on the console, a series of moving images appeared on the wall of the chamber. Many of the images were of Larubia himself, both clothed and naked. Other scenes depicted a peasant walking beside a cart, a dilapidated train entering a tunnel, and a production line in a flying saucer factory. One particularly gruesome sequence showed the robots melting a dog that had attacked them. While Larubia was watching the picture show, one of the beings jabbed a syringe into his right middle finger and extracted blood. The being then squirted the contents of the syringe at the wall, making a pattern of three circles intersected by an L. Without warning, Larubia suddenly found himself outside the bus depot where he worked. One of the robots was standing beside him, and the giant disc was hovering overhead. Then the robot vanished and the disc shot straight up. Although he went to work as usual that day, Larubia became very ill over the weekend. He suffered from insatiable thirst, vomiting, burning throat pains and dizzy spells. On Monday morning he returned to work and reported to the company nurse. When he told her about his abduction, she had him physically restrained, thinking he had gone mad. Luckily for Larubia, a psychologist examined him and pronounced him sane before sending him to hospital for a checkup. It took him several days to recover from the side effects of his encounter. Sources The Michigan Dogman The Michigan Dogman is a cryptozoological creature first reported in 1887 in Wexford County, Michigan. Sightings have been reported in several locations throughout Michigan, primarily in the northwestern quadrant of the Lower Peninsula. In 1987, the legend of the Michigan Dogman gained popularity when a disc jockey at WTCMFM recorded a song about the creature and its reported sightings. Big Rapids 1961 When I was a boy, my father was the night watchman at a manufacturing plant located in a rural area between Big Rapids and Chippewa Lake, Michigan. Our house, which if I remember right was a perk of the night watchman job, was across the street from the factory. The plant building was right next to a large wilderness area of state land. At that time it was simply known as the Haymarsh, but now it is officially called the Haymarsh State Game Area. We didn't understand it at the time, but Dad was always very skittish about letting us play outside after dark. He would sometimes talk about hearing coyotes or bears roaming around in the Haymarsh when he was walking the perimeter of the building at night. One night in the summer of 1961, Dad walked back to the house to sit on the porch and have a cup of coffee and a sweet roll. He had a good view of the entire plant property. He saw some movement near a chain link fence behind the building. This was approximately 3 a.m., so he felt quite sure this person wasn't there by accident. He drew his gun and watched for a few minutes. That's when he noticed this was not a person at all, but something much taller. He said it appeared to be covered in brown slash gray hair. It had very broad shoulders and a powerful chest. It alternated between walking on four legs, then standing up on two. He said it seemed to be looking for something along the driveway. He said later he couldn't quite believe what he was seeing. He quietly moved into the house and grabbed his Kodak Signet 35mm camera, which was his pride and joy. At this point I should mention that Dad was quite a photography buff. His father had owned one of the first camera stores in Ohio, and Dad got the shutterbug from Grandpa. As he stepped back onto the front porch, the creature moved slowly along the driveway, directly under the lights. He adjusted the camera shutter for a long exposure, held it as still as he could, he said he was shaking pretty bad by then, and snapped a picture. I've enclosed a print of it in this letter. Dad said a few seconds later, the thing dropped back down to all fours, and slowly moved off into the woods, to the left in this picture. He sent a print to the local newspaper, and sent copies to several magazines. One that I think was called Mist Arian published the photo in their spring issue of 1962. Dad had a copy of the magazine for years, but it was misplaced after he passed away. I still have the negative strip that contains this image, if you would like to have someone examine it. I also still have Dad's Kodak Signet. 
I haven't shot any pictures with it for several years, but I'm pretty sure it still works. Sources Unknown Entity Gas Plant, Kennedy, Texas November 2012 I was working the night shift on an X-ray crew at a material gas plant. This was around 3 a.m. and there was only four of us in the plant at the time. I took this picture after seeing something swaying side to side out of the corner of my eye. I was in the basket of a man lift coming down when I took the picture. By the time I unhooked my harness to get out of the basket the creature was gone. The police were called and walked premises. The officer told me there were 26 UFO sighting calls throughout that night. If you zoom in you can see the silhouettes of eyes and elongated mouth. I have no doubt of what I believed I seen that night. The other person that saw it with me took off running for the truck. Follow up received from witness, you can use my name and the picture was taken near Kennedy, Texas. I appreciate the quick reply. The picture was even printed in the local newspaper in Kennedy. I had sent the picture to the officer who came to the plant and assume he sent it to the newspaper. Praying Mantis Man Sighting Musconetcong River, Hackettstown, New Jersey I have recently been doing research regarding an encounter I had about five years ago. Fly fishing on the Musconetcong River in New Jersey with my boss, I saw briefly what I could only describe as a praying mantis man. Although the water was clear, there had been heavy rains the past couple of days. We should not have been out there, the river was smooth but the current was exceptionally strong. I was leaning backwards and digging my heels into the, the gravel but the river was still kicking me along pretty good. Sketchy navigating. Please know, I am privy to the paranormal and always have been. Shadow people, ghosts, whatever. But what I encountered that day was not spirit. It was a biological, living creature. But it disappeared into thin air almost as soon as I saw it. For whatever reason, my searches at the time turned up nothing. But then by chance I came across an alien race type video on YouTube and there in the artwork I saw what I saw, ancient mantis leaders. So when I began searching mantis alien instead of praying mantis man, I found a lot more. They say they are interdimensional, whatever that means, but I did not get that impression. No. This creature was cloaked and because of both my innate sensory perception skills and the particular physical circumstances at the time, important, I can add details if you are interested, I just caught it. Movement out of the corner of my eye to my left and there it was. Humanoid. Tall. Six foot at least, no reference points, but I sent six foot six to seven feet. Moving away from me back up the bank. I am chest high in the river, the first thing I see was the grasshopper thigh, but bending forward like a human. Then the whole form. He is looking at me over his shoulder, moving up the bank, astonished, amazed. What, that I am in the water in a strong current, that I can see him. But yes we lock eyes and this creature is astonished, I get the sense that he can't believe I am in the water, that he can't believe I have seen him that I am not perturbed at all, something of all three, I still don't know, just astonishment and he is actually trying to get away from me and the water. Triangular head. Huge, slanted black eyes. Just like a praying mantis. Its whole body was gangly, knobby, knobby, but you could still sense it was powerful, and no, I would not say it was a big bug. It was definitely humanoid despite the mantis slash insect qualities. This took place in Hackettstown, New Jersey. The stretch of the Musconetcong River here is unusual in that its west bank borders RT-46, a local highway, congested with lots of stores, but the east bank where we were fishing borders fields and farmlands. No bank to speak of on the developed side, but the sloping bank on the rural side was high, 10 feet. A strip of trees about 10 to 20 yards thick separated the river from the fields beyond, but there was the occasional gap slash path, each about 20 yards wide that allowed clear access to the river. The weather had been bad the previous several days, and the sky was white and heavy. It was mid-afternoon. 
When I saw the mantis man, it was in one of these gaps, moving back up the bank towards the fields, looking back at me over its left shoulder. About 15 to 20 yards away. So understand that it was several feet above me, I looked up at it, and framed clearly against that blank slash white sky. Like a full ghost apparition, it was indeed clear but nevertheless nearly transparent and fading fast. Then it evaporated mid-stride. Again, I stress the strong impression that the mantis man was cloaked and I caught it just right, it abruptly found itself against a new slash blank background and was adjusting quickly. No, I do not believe it slipped into another dimension slash plane. I detected movement and first saw that strong left thigh, and strong right calf, then the whole thing and immediately those eyes slash face. The whole encounter was only a couple of seconds. I can not tell you with any strong certainty what its feet or hands looked like, I wasn't looking there, but I can tell you that its arms were normal, and not the literal mantis four legs I have recently seen in drawings of these aliens. The Minerva Monster BFRO Report Report number 4977, Class A Submitted by Ron Schaffner on Wednesday, January 1, 1997 Ron Schaffner Case Report, The 1978 Minerva Flap Year, 1978 Season, Summer Month, August State, Ohio County, Stark County Location Details, U.S. Route 30, West of Minerva, Ohio in Paris Township, Stark County Investigators, Ron Schaffner, Earl Jones, Jim Carnes Jim Rast Eder, Iona Boyce, Barbara Madrak, Akron Beacon Journal, and James Shannon, Stark County Deputy Sheriff. Case data, all of our interviews and field investigations were conducted on the weekends of September 9th and 30, 1978. Other interviews were conducted by the late Jim Rast Eder and his research team, the press, and local law enforcement. We will list the incidents by date since there are several encounters. There are also many newspaper reports from this time period mostly from the Akron Beacon Journal. The reader should be aware that these incidents are multiple witness sightings which adds some credence to the reports. The reports of large felines in conjunction with the hominids are a subject that I have never been able to explain. I will begin with the first major sighting which occurred on 21, August. Evelyn Caton's family and friends were out on the front porch when they heard noises in the direction of an old chicken coop just to the right of the house. They saw two pairs of yellow eyes that seemed to be reflecting a porch light. Scott Patterson went to his car and turned the headlights on in hopes of getting a better look. The eyes were emitting from what appeared to be two cougar-type felines. Then, the party saw what looked like a large bipedal hairy creature step in front of the large cats as if to protect them. This creature then proceeded to lurch towards Patterson's car. The witnesses fled to the house and called the Stark County Sheriff's Department. While waiting for the deputies, the bipedal creature appeared at the kitchen window, about four yards from the kitchen table. Patterson pointed a 22 caliber pistol at it, while Evelyn Caton loaded a 22 caliber rifle. The creature stood outside the window for close to 10 minutes. They all could clearly see the creature because of the back porch light. They decided they would not shot at it unless the creature made any advances toward them. The bip suddenly left without harming anyone. Sketch of creature is on file with us. It doesn't seem to want to bother anyone, said Mary Ackerman. It was just curious. We all felt that it wanted to be friends. Deputy Sheriff James Shannon arrived about 15 minutes after the call was made and about 5 minutes after the creature left the scene. A strong stench was still lingering in the area when Deputy Shannon began to interview the witnesses. Shannon later told reporters that it smelled like ammonia sulfur. Extra deputies were brought in and they searched the entire area on horseback and in jeeps. The land behind the Catons was an old abandoned strip mine and beyond that were dense woods going up a gradual hill. Unusual, but unsubstantiated footprints were discovered. 22, August, Mrs. Mary Ackerman, of Minerva drove to the Caton residence to pick up her daughter and friend. 
Mrs. Ackerman is Evelyn Caden's daughter. As she turned into the driveway, she saw the same creature standing on top of the hill next to the strip mine. She watched it until it walked out of her view. 23, August, the creature appeared again at Caden residence. How Caden was not sure if it was the same thing. He fired a gunshot into the air and the figure departed. 8, September, during the late daylight hours, Mrs. Ackerman observed two ape-like animals across the strip mine. She stated that she thought the creatures were standing in a tree but wasn't sure because of the distance. Again, she watched them for a while, until they were no longer visible in the thick weeds. 9, September, Jim Rast Etter interviewed Henry Cold who lives about 5 miles east of Minerva on US 30. He told Jim that he was walking through some woods by his house when he caught a glimpse of an unknown furry animal. Mr. Cold said that the animal was squatting next to a tree and let out a sound similar to a loud cough. Actually, the incidents leading up to the August 21st sighting began about the first of the month. Mrs. Caton believes the creature's appearance were due to her husband, Herbert, cutting down the thick brush next to the pit and that he also dumped some garbage around for the raccoons. Several nights later, Caton's grandchildren and their friends came running in the house crying in a frightened state. They claimed to have seen a large hairy monster in the pit. Mrs. Keck, Mrs. Caton, and how Caton went outside to see what had scared them. They saw a creature that was covered with dark matted hair. They estimated it to be about 300 pounds and 7 feet tall. It just stood there, said Mrs. Caton. It didn't move, but I almost broke my neck running back down the hill. Mrs. Caton claims that she later observed the creature in the daylight. It was sitting in the pit picking at the garbage. She could not make out any facial features due to the amount of long hair covering its face. She remembered that the creature had no visible neck. More ground level activity and comments, what about the two phantom cougars? This is one of the most puzzling aspects of this case. The ape-like creature was described by the witnesses as if to be protecting the big cats. If Patterson's testimony is truthful, the how should we ascertain such statements? Does this mean that these creatures live in harmony with each other, or is it more soft evidence to indicate that all this phenomena is originating from the same source? Deputy Shannon said that he received many reports of bear and panther-like bobcats in the area. Was the creature a bear? Although the Ohio Division of Wildlife debunked the idea of bears, we know that they are coming into eastern Ohio from Pennsylvania. We also discovered a bear explanation was used by local law enforcement to downplay the incidents. This reasoning was used to keep the local vigilantes and hunters away from the woods. We asked Mrs. Caton, do you think what you saw were bears? She answered, no, not unless they were mutated. Canine activity, prior to the August 21st sightings, one of the Caton's German shepherds was found dead with a broken neck. The dog had been chained up with a collar to the dog house. The collar was found next to the dead animal still intact to the chain. We can speculate that either, 1. The creature jerked the dog out of the collar, or, 2. The canine was so scared that it broke its own neck trying to escape. Consider the following, the other shepherd, Missy, was still in a schizophrenic state during our investigations. At times, she is extremely calm and affectionate and on other occasions, she is scared and vicious. Missy has spent a lot of time digging, which is not uncharacteristic of a canine. However, she dug a tunnel about 8 feet into the ground. This hole is almost large enough to contain two medium-sized dogs. Could this be a hiding place for the dog for when the creature returns? Evaluation, according to the Cadens and Mrs. Madrak, the sheriff's department did an excellent investigation. However, there are some conflicting reports. The deputies stayed with the family until the early morning hours. They studied alleged prints and hair, but came up with no monster. They covered up the incidents to discourage hunters. They supposedly took the soft evidence to a local college in Canton for analysis. When we tried to obtain this evidence, Malone College told us they did not receive anything. Many investigators have since talked to the Caton family. 
I believe that they are sincere people who would have no real benefit to hoax. Evelyn had just been released from the hospital due to an ulcer and a thyroid tumor. Her doctors told her to avoid emotional stress, so why would she fabricate a story like this? She did not need this type of publicity. One must not forget that this is a multiple witnesses incident. With this many witnesses, interviewed separately, then as a group, it could be easy for one to slip up, but all stuck to the same story. One cannot forget about the deputy's investigation and other phenomena surrounding these incidents. The witnesses were unfamiliar with the term Bigfoot, until the press caught wind of the story. Barbara Madrak gave us an excellent character reference of the witnesses. She told us, prior to our on-site investigations, that she really believed that the Catons were telling the truth about their visitor. Earl Jones and myself visited the Catons on two separate occasions. On our second visit, we backpacked and spent the night in the upper woods looking for physical evidence. We came up with no evidence, nor did we witness anything unusual. We did feel the need for more hours logged, but were unable to do so, for lack of financial means. Could not afford lost time from our jobs. Time and Conditions, 1978, August 21st at 10.30 p.m., August 22nd at 9 p.m., August 23rd at 11 p.m., September 8th at 6 p.m. and September 9th, time unknown in the evening. All sightings were in 1978. There were other reports from as early as July and the first week of August. Hey everyone, I am a little earlier than usual today, it's one of those lazy days I guess. Ever heard of the Shag Harbor incident? If not, then here we go. It's not about a bizarre being or entity, but a strange, um, incident, as it were, and it has nothing to do with actual shagging, but aliens. Possibly. Incident at Shag Harbor. On the night of October 4, 1967, numerous residents of Shag Harbor, a small fishing village on Nova Scotia southeast coast, witnesses a multi-lighted craft which eventually appeared to crash into the sound. The sound is the western entrance to Shag Harbor proper. The unidentified flying object was observed drifting with the current on the sound by more than a dozen witnesses including three RCMP officers. All of the witnesses both in and around Shag Harbor reported what they thought was an airplane crashing near Shag Harbor. The three Mounties contacted local boat captains and the Rescue Coordination Center, RCC, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The Mounties initiated a recovery operation, fully expecting to find bodies and wreckage out on the water. Initially two fishing boats loaded with volunteers went out on the water and searched. They were eventually joined by others and Coast Guard Cutter 101. What is impressive is the amount of documentation of armed forces teletypes, principally the RCAF's airdisc in the nation's capital, Ottawa. The newspapers responded to the event carrying stories about the event and one-inch headlines in Eastern Canada's largest, conservative newspaper, the Chronicle Herald. For a short time the Shag Harbor UFO incident became a worldwide story and as case number 34 was left unsolved in the Condon report. The incident is in two components, the documented case and the subsequent anecdotal case supplied by retired military personnel from the Canadian Army, Air Force and Navy. During the first two hours of the incident Coast Guard Cutter 101 joined the search but it also brought news from RCC, Halifax. No airplanes were reported missing. This left the searchers and witnesses wondering, what had they seen that evening in the sky and floating on the waters off Shag Harbor, a mystery that has endured to this day. The Royal Canadian Air Force designated it a UFO. It was a little after 11 p.m. On the night of October 4, 1967, when an unknown object with four bright lights flashing in sequence and estimated at 60 feet in diameter, was observed hovering over the ocean near the small fishing village of Shag Harbor, Nova Scotia. Several residents of the village first noticed a rather strange grouping of orange lights. Several eyewitness accounts indicate that there were four orange lights that evening. 
Five of these witnesses included a group of teenagers who watched these lights flash in sequence for several minutes, and then suddenly and rapidly dive in a sharp 45-degree angle toward the water's surface. To the amazement of the teens, and other eyewitnesses, on hitting the water's surface the lights did not immediately disappear beneath the gentle swells, but seemed to float on the surface, approximately one half mile from the shore. The initial panicked reaction of the observers was that they were witnessing the emergency ditching or crash of an airplane. The first report phoned into the RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, in Barrington, came from a young fisherman who told them that an airliner had gone into the bay. The first reaction by the police dispatcher was that the young man had been drinking, however after an immediate rash of 10 additional calls reporting the incident, the police quickly recontacted the young fisherman for location details. Within the same time period however, Constable Ron Pound of the RCMP was on patrol on Highway 3, heading toward Shag Harbor, and had been observing the strange lights as he increased his speed toward the incident. Constable Pound's report was that he believed that the four lights were coming from a single aircraft, that he estimated to be about 60 feet long. As Constable Pound reached the shoreline he was joined by two other officers, Police Corporal Victor Werbeke, and Constable Ron O'Brien. Additionally, several of the fishing village's residents stood on the shore watching and questioning what to do next. According to Constable Pound and the other officers, the orange light slowly changed to yellow, and the object appeared to move slowly across the surface of the water, leaving a yellowish foam in its wake. By this time no fewer than 30 witnesses from various vantage points, watched as the object slowly drifted further from shore, all would later describe the object as about 60 feet long, 10 or so feet high and dome-shaped. After about 5 minutes, the object started to sink beneath the icy North Atlantic waves. A few of the eyewitnesses reported hearing a whooshing noise. While the RCMP had already been in communication with the Canadian Coast Guard and Cutter 101 was on the way two of the RCMP officers and a few local fishermen hurriedly launched their boats to speed to the rescue of any survivors. As the small boats, and Cutter 101 reached the location, the lights were no longer visible but they found themselves sailing through a thick yellow foam, that indicated that something had submerged. The fishermen report that the foam was not sea foam, and looked like nothing they had ever seen. In fact most were unnerved by the fact that they had to sail through it to look for survivors. After several hours of searching nothing was found and the search was called off at approximately 3 a.m. Both the NORAD and the Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax had been contacted by the RCMP and found that there had been no reports that evening of missing aircraft, either civilian or military. On October 5th, the following day, the Rescue Coordination Center filed a report with the Canadian Forces Headquarters in Ottawa. This report stated that something had crashed into the water in Shag Harbour, but the object was of unknown origin. The Canadian Forces Headquarters dispatched the HMCS Granby to Shag Harbour crash site, and using advanced detection equipment and specially trained divers from the Navy and the RCMP, the Canadian military systematically searched the seafloor for several days, and found nothing. Here in 1967, the mystery ended with no physical evidence ever recovered, and no additional leads. For a few years the story kicked around in the local papers. From time to time various theories and intriguing rumors emerged about Russian spacecraft, or Russian submarines, and an American follow-up investigation. Then the story simply faded into obscurity. That is, until 1993 when the Shag Harbor incident once again was brought to the attention of the public. This was due to the dedicated investigative efforts of two men who are MUFON investigators. Chris Stiles, assisted by Doug Ledger, using public records such as newspaper clippings, and police reports were able to track down and interview many of the eyewitnesses and individuals involved in the Shag Harbor sighting, the rescue attempt, and in the subsequent investigation. Through their work, some extremely compelling clues and amazing new insights were uncovered. In interviews with divers, and crew members from the HMCS Granby they discovered some startling information. The object that dove into the waters off of Shag Harbor had been tracked, 
and it had actually traveled underwater for a distance of about 25 miles to a place called Government Point. In the 1960s the U.S. had maintained a small but technically advanced military base at Government Point, managing a magnetic anomaly detection system, MAD grid, for the purpose of detecting and tracking submarines in the North Atlantic using the U.S. military had most definitely detected the object on its sensitive tracking equipment. Naval vessels were dispatched and positioned over the unidentified object, where it had stopped. After three days of no movement, and not knowing exactly what it was, the military was planning to initiate an investigative salvage operation. As the Navy waited and planned, the detection equipment picked up another object moving in, and to the amazement of all those involved, joined the first object on the ocean floor. The speculation at the time, was that the second UFO, I guess officially now an underwater flying object, was there to render aid to the first object. Not fully comprehending what they were dealing with the Navy decided it was best to stand by and observe. For nearly a week the Navy vessels held their position over the UFOs. The detection base however, located a Russian submarine that had entered Canadian waters to the north, so several of the vessels had to be pulled off target to sail north to investigate. Under the cover of this new activity on the surface, both UFOs made their move, accelerating underwater toward the Gulf of Maine. The remaining Navy vessels pursued them toward the United States, but the objects continued to distance themselves from their trackers. To the astonishment of the pursuers, both of the objects broke to the surface and shot skyward to vanish within seconds. According to the researchers, while these observations were well corroborated by many credible eyewitnesses, these accounts were given off the record by military, ex-military, and civilian personnel who fear harassment, ridicule, or loss of pension. So as the saying goes, only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Clearly, a series of very extraordinary, and still unexplained UFO encounters, involving the navies of two countries and NORAD, occurred at Shag Harbor on October 4, 1967, and in the following week in the deep waters off of the coast of Maine. Sources 1971, Palos Verdes, California, USA John Hodges and Pete Rodriguez were walking to their car on a remote road at 2 in the morning when they saw a mysterious white light shine through the trees. When they entered their vehicle and turned on the headlights, they saw what resembled a pair of brains lying in the road. Frightened, they drove off and arrived home two hours later than the trip should have taken. Years later, Hodges underwent hypnosis to learn more about his missing time and recalled hearing a voice in his mind as the larger brain hovered towards the car, telling him that mankind would be instruments of their own fate. He later recalled being transported to a room where more conventional grey humanoids informed him that Earth had too much power, and highlighted a map of places where man could destroy themselves. He was also told that the brain beings were merely translators. 1958, Domsten, Stad, Sweden Stig Rydberg and Hans Gustafsson were driving through a thick fog at 3 in the morning, 2 to 3 is close encounter hour, if many of these cases are to be believed, when they stopped to investigate a weird glow and discovered a 12-foot flying saucer surrounded by four bluish jelly bags somehow. Jumping wildly around the object. The men stood in shock until the being suddenly attacked them, latching on with powerful suction and dragging them towards the craft. The men struggled against their captors, but their arms only sunk into their slimy bodies. Rydberg eventually squirmed free from their grip, ran back to his car and began honking the horn, which caused the blobs to drop his friend and shoot back into their saucer, which immediately took off. Both men felt ill for days later, and could vividly recall the horrible stench of the aliens, like ether and burnt sausage. Is Bigfoot possibly an alien entity? By Dr. Franklin Rule, PhD rather than being a missing link between man and the apes, Bigfoot may possibly be an alien entity. This intriguing possibility is derived from evidence in several solid UFO cases. The earliest clues date back to 1888, 
when a cattleman described an encounter with friendly Indians in Humboldt County, California. They led him to a cave where he saw a hefty humanoid creature covered in long, shiny black hair, with no neck, sitting cross-legged. One Indian told him three of these crazy bears had been cast out of a small moon that dropped from the sky and landed. The moon then ascended back into the air. So it's highly likely the crazy bears were really Bigfoots, and the moon, a spacecraft. Now fast forward almost 100 years to 1973. And Mrs. Rifa Heightfield. She and her 13 year old son were sleeping in a trailer in Cincinnati, Ohio on the morning of October 21st. Rifa arose at 2.30 a.m. to quench her thirst, and noticed strange lights in the adjoining parking lot looking out the window, her attention was drawn, in particular, to an inexplicable cone of light, shaped like a huge bubble umbrella, about seven feet in diameter. Nearby she spotted a grayish, ape-like creature with a large, downward-angled snout, no neck, and a sizable waist. Moving slowly, it then entered into the light. About five minutes later, both Ape Man and UFO disappeared. Another dramatic incident occurred a few days later on October 25, 1973. A group of farmers in Fayette County, Pennsylvania caught sight of a dome-shaped UFO that was brightly lit and about 100 feet in diameter. As the locals drove toward it, they saw a pair of gargantuan creatures covered with thick, matted hair, luminescent green eyes and long arms that dangled below their knees. A farmer's son fired a gunshot at the creatures, one of which raised its right hand in the air. At that very moment, the UFO disappeared. Then, the two Bigfoots escaped into the woods and were never seen again. Dairy farmer William Bozak of Frederick, Wisconsin was returning from a co-op meeting about 10.30 p.m. On December 9, 1974, when he nearly slammed into a globular UFO on the road in front of him, its bottom half enshrouded in fog. Inside the visible transparent dome was a six-foot-tall ape-like creature with reddish-brown fur covering its body, except for the face, and distinctive pointed ears. It appeared to be operating a control panel. As Bozak passed by, the object suddenly arose and disappeared. In August, 1976, after a series of UFO sightings around Rutland, British Columbia, Canada, several men and their children saw a hairy ape-like entity, six to seven feet tall roaming about a mountainside. They also found a clump of hair that was sent to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police for identification. Laboratory analysis confirmed it was primate hair, but, significantly, it could not be matched to any known species on Earth. Perhaps the Bigfoot creatures are UFO pilots, landing on Earth for exploratory purposes. Or, conceivably, higher-level ETS are leaving behind some specimens as guinea pigs to test our environment for long-term survival. Or, possibly these Bigfoots are criminal entities being deposited on Earth as a form of cosmic deportation. The following information is reworded from one of my current reads, Lauren Coleman's Mysterious America. In May 1981, on the first week of the month, individuals dressed in clown outfits suddenly appeared in Boston, Massachusetts and would harass and entice school children, enticing them to follow them or come along with them. These reports were widely and openly discussed in the newspapers, amongst the school committee, the area police, and parents, and children. On May 6, 1981, the Boston Police DEP were responding to several complaints of men in clown suits harassing elementary school children. One of the estranged individuals was wearing a clown suit only from the waist up, from the waist down he was nude. The clown was driving a black van near the area between 4 o'clock and 6 p.m. A day earlier, in the city of Brookline, two clown men tried to lure children into their black van with offerings of candy. The police had a good description of the van, it was an older model, black, with ladders on the side, a broken headlight, and no hubcaps. This created such a stir that the investigative counselor, Daniel O'Donnell of the Boston Public School District even sent a memo to all the district's elementary and middle school principals saying, 
It has been brought to the attention of the police department and the district office that adults dressed as clowns have been bothering children to and from school. Please advise all students that they must stay away from strangers, especially ones dressed as clowns. The clowns spread from city to city East Boston, Charlestown, Cambridge, Canton, Randolph, and other cities near Boston. Police even tried stopping birthday clowns and other clown businesses to investigate but all were legitimate and no arrests were made. A couple other frightening reports of a clown in a yellow van this time, ordering a girl to get inside the van while brandishing a knife. Another clown, or possibly a different one, welded a sword a couple days later in Kansas. The clown in the yellow van was wearing a black shirt with a devil picture on the front, and two candy canes on the sides of his black pants. A person dressed as a rabbit was also sighted and was attempting to frighten children. Even stranger so, a trio of people dressed as Spider-Man, Gorilla, and a clown in Arlington Heights PA tried to entice a boy into a vehicle. These clowns never went noticed by national scale, but further reading indicates that these reports were widespread and there was a large flap during that time period not only in the Midwest and East of the USA. Luckily, no children were ever captured or sexually slash physically attacked by the clowns. 1977, Prospect, Kentucky, USA. Driving home one night at one in the morning, 19-year-old Lee Parrish spotted a rectangular object hovering in the sky. Suddenly, his radio failed and he felt unable to control his vehicle. He arrived home with sore and bloodshot eyes, unable to account for more than a half hour of time. Under hypnosis, he vividly described being transported from his driver's seat into a huge, round room containing three strange creatures or machines. One towering figure was at least 20 feet tall, resembling a rough black tombstone with a single, pointed arm. Another, fatter being was six feet tall and pure white, with two unmoving arms and a wedge-like head. Lee got the impression that the white being was the leader, and it constantly emitted odd sounds like teeth being brushed. The third, smallest being was red and rectangular, and Lee sensed that this being was afraid of him as it approached and touched his head. He felt a cold, stinging sensation and later believed he had been analyzed in some way. After their brief contact, the red being seemed to disappear behind the white being, the white being slid behind the black being, and the black being began to back away, which made Parrish feel warmer. He found himself abruptly back in his jeep. 1951, Georgia Airspace, USA Pilot Fred Reagan was flying his Piper Club over Georgia when he felt a mysterious force pull his plane upward, crashing it into an unidentified flying object. Finding himself suddenly inside the strange craft, he encountered three entities, roughly three feet in height, which he likened to giant, metallic stalks of asparagus. The hovering creatures, or perhaps robots, apologized to him for the accident, gave him a quick medical exam and informed him that they had he was now cured of cancer, which he never knew he had, but we're totally even on the collision thing now, right? Fred was eventually found unconscious in a field without so much as a scratch, the wreckage of his plane nearby. Its engine was buried almost six feet into the ground, having fallen thousands of feet. Eleven months later, Reagan died mysteriously of degenerating brain tissue, a symptom of overexposure to atomic radiation. Betty was in her kitchen around 6.30 p.m. on the night of her abduction. The rest of her family, seven children, her mother and father were in the living room. The lights in the house began to blink, and a red light beamed into the house through the kitchen window. Betty's kids were on edge after the lights blinked and she ran to quiet them. Startled by the red beam, Betty's father ran to look out of the kitchen window to see where the light was coming from. He was amazed to see five strange creatures heading toward their house in a hopping motion and startled when the creatures simply walked through the wooden door of the kitchen. In a moment, the entire family was put into a type of trance. Betty's father was attended to by one of the creatures, while another began to have telepathic conversations with Betty. She and her father both thought that one of the creatures was the leader who was about five feet tall. The other four were approximately a foot shorter. They had very wide eyes, small ears, and noses, 
set in a pear-shaped head. There were only slits where their mouth should have been. They only communicated with their minds. The five creatures wore a blue coverall with a wide belt. On their sleeves could be seen a logo of a bird. Three fingers were on their hands and their feet were shod with boots. They did not actually walk, but floated as they moved along. Betty later recalled that she was not frightened by their presence, but instead, felt rather calm. Meanwhile, Betty's mother and children were still in a state of suspended animation. When Betty seemed worried about them, the aliens released her 11-year-old daughter from the trance to assure her that no harm was being done to her family. Soon, Betty was taken by the aliens to a waiting craft, which rested on a hill outside of her home. Betty estimated the craft to be about 20 feet in diameter and saucer-shaped. Betty recalls that after she was aboard the craft, it took off and joined a mother ship. There she was subjected to a physical examination and the victim of tests by strange equipment. She was given one test which caused her pain, but resulted in being a religious awakening. She estimates that she was gone for four hours before being brought home by two of the aliens. Returning home, she ran to see the rest of her family. They were yet in some kind of suspended state. All along, one of the aliens had waited behind with her family. Finally, they were released from the bonds of the trance and the aliens left. Betty had been hypnotized and told not to reveal any details of her experience. Though some of the details of her abduction were temporarily lost to her, some things she was able to recall. She remembered the power outage, the red beam of light coming into the house, and the aliens coming in. Some eight years after her experience, she answered an ad from researcher Dr. J. Allen Hinek. He was soliciting for anyone who may have had an alien experience. The letter she sent to Hinek was rejected, however, being too bizarre to be believed. Two more years would transpire before her story would be investigated. The group of investigators included an electronics engineer, an aerospace engineer, and telecommunications specialist, a solar physicist, and a UFO investigator. Betty's case of alien abduction was very strange and contained much more information than the average case. For 12 months, Betty was involved in character analysis, polygraph examinations, psychiatric review, and 14 sessions of regressive hypnosis. The results of this analysis were presented in a 528-page review. The review basically stated that Betty and daughter were sane individuals, believing in their experience as presented. Check out BJ Booth's interview with Betty and Dreson Luca at UFO Casebook. Hypnotic Regression Transcripts The following are the exact transcripts from her hypnotic regression when Betty was regressed to her childhood during one of her first abduction experiences and her encounter with the one. We're coming up to this wall of glass and a big, 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 big door. It's made out of glass. Does it have hinges? No. It is so big and there is, I can't explain it. It is door after door after door after door. He, the alien leading her, is stopping there and telling me to stop. I'm just stopping there. He says, now you shall enter the door to see the one. And he says, fear not. Then Betty appeared to undergo an out of body experience. And I'm standing there and I'm coming out of myself. There's two of me. There's two of me there. Are you looking at yourself? Uh-huh. Okay. Do you see the one yet? The one? No. Okay, go on. I'm coming up to the door, and the little person is saying, now you shall enter the great door and see the glory of the one. And I'm standing face to face with that door. Betty now stood before the strange door. Again she described its appearance and her out-of-body experience. There's a big door there, and it is big, but it is strange. It is like deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's bright, really bright. And I have to stand before the door. But, before that, I came out of myself. I was just standing over there, and I was standing over here. There were two of me, but that one over there was stiff. Have you tried to talk to your other self? 
that won't work, because I'm over here, and that one is over there. She looks exactly like you. Is she making motions to show you she is alive, like breathing, moving her arms? No. Would you say she looks like a wax museum piece or something? No, it looks just like me. All right, go on. I was told to come forward. I went in the door, and it's very bright. I can't take you any further. Why? Because. What do you mean, because? I can't take you past this door. Okay, I'll tell you what. You go past that door alone then for a few minutes, okay. Time and again, the hypnotist tried in different ways to induce Betty to tell him what was behind the door, all in vain. Sometime maybe, if you change your mind, would you tell me? I can't change my mind. It is said. What would happen to you if you did tell me? I can't tell you. I'm sorry. Okay, let's proceed to the first thing you can tell me. Fair enough. Oh. Betty's face glows with joy. What's happening now? I'm coming out of that door, and it was wonderful. Did the one say something exciting? I can't tell you. I'm sorry. Would you say that the one was God? Do you really know what God is? I don't know. I was hoping that you had seen him and could therefore tell me. I can't tell you about that. Okay, let's proceed. What's happening now? You just came out of the room, and you feel great. I come out of the door, and there is a tall white-haired man standing there and he's got on a long nightgown. The next session took place on May 15, 1980. Determined to find out what lay behind the great door, the hypnotist again brought Betty back in time to where she was standing before it. Where are you? I'm before this huge great big door. It's glass. Layers and layers of glass. What are you standing on? Glass. Let me ask you now, you're going to see the one now, right? Yeah. Why are you going to see the one? Because it is time for me, they said, for me to go home to see the one. All right, in other words, does this imply that the one is someone that you have seen before? I don't remember. Okay. Do you know why it is time to see the one? Why haven't you asked questions? They haven't been there very often. Those little people haven't been there very much for me to ask. Yeah, but they are asking you to do a lot of things, shall we say? I know. But, I'm in their place. I can't do anything. Okay. In a moment you're going to see the one, right? We don't want to waste the experience. We want to get the most out of it. So when you see the one, I want you to ask yourself, what am I getting out of this? Why am I here? And, what will this mean to me later on in my life? It's like any big experience a person is allowed to have. Okay. I want you to progress to where the door is open and you are seeing the one. Oh. At that very moment, an indescribable smile came over Betty's face. The only adjective that the investigators could think of to describe it is rapturous. This expression of pure, unrestricted happiness remained on Betty's face as the hypnotist continued to question her. You seem happy. Why are you so happy? It's just, ah, I just. I can't tell you about it. All right. I know you can't tell me, but I want you to do a few things. I want you to ask yourself why you are being shown that which you are being shown. In other words, you weren't given this trip just for a free ride, so to speak. They want you to see what you are seeing. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Now that you're there, ask yourself, what am I getting out of this? Why am I here? What am I supposed to think about after I leave here? Oh, it matters not what I get from it. What do you mean? It's, words cannot explain it. It's wonderful. It's for everybody. I just can't tell you this. You can't? Okay, why can't you? For one thing, 
it's too overwhelming and it is, it is indescribable. I just can't tell you. Besides it's just impossible for me to tell you. All right. Are you capable, when looking around you, to tell yourself? I see it. Right. That which you can see, you have a grasp of even if you don't understand it. I understand it. I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. I wish I could share it with you. Were you told not to share it with me? It is like even if I was able to speak it, I wouldn't be able to speak it. I can't. I'm sorry. Were you specifically told not to speak it? Partly, yeah. How was it expressed to you? I can't tell you those things. I'm sorry. All right. Can we let the being speak through you? Suppose you just relax, and I'll put my hand on your shoulder and with each number you will go deeper and deeper. When I reach three, you will just relax and allow the beings to speak through you. One, two, three. Betty began speaking in a strange tongue. Okay, Betty, can you explain to me so that I could understand what you have just said? Betty begins crying father loves the world so very much. Yes. And so many reject him. Uh huh, okay. You said a lot of words. Can you explain more of what you said? They will be felt by those who believe and have faith. They will feel the love radiating from them. Okay, where are you now? I'm where there is light. And what do you see? I cannot tell you this. Okay, that's all right. Let me ask you. Do you feel much love, the same love, or any different degree of love now than you have before? It's a greater love. Okay. When will I understand all of the words that the being said through you? When you allow the spirit to come upon you and you are filled with that love. Do you understand all the words that you have said? I understand them, but they will not come forth. Okay, I'm trying to understand. I'm not trying to ask you to divulge anything, alright? You understand them, but you can't express them. They're in my heart. More like a feeling than a concept? They're in my heart, in my mind, in my body. Okay, could you explain this to your children? What children? During this hypnotic session, Betty was regressed to a childhood experience when she was single with no children. If you have children someday. The words that you spoke, while they had a message of love in them, did they also have a warning? Yes. Those that do not have love have nothing. Love is the answer. Again the hypnotist failed to elicit the information that he sought regarding what Betty had experienced while behind the great door. With endless patience, he tried yet again. Okay. You've seen the one. Do you feel different about anything now than you did before? Everything is so wonderful. Is there anybody that you don't like? No. There are some people, shall we say, that aren't as nice as other people, right? No, everybody is nice. They are just growing, that's all. If one doesn't understand another one, they are just growing, that's all. Okay, just relax. You've been to see the one and now everything is a little nicer, right? I understand that everything is one. What do you mean? Everything fits together. Everything is one. It's beautiful. No matter what it is. Betty's experience with the one ends here. Sources Nephilim, Evil Behemoths The word or term Nephilim appears twice in the Hebrew Bible, both in the Torah. The first is Genesis 6 1 through 4, immediately before the Noah's Ark story, when men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal, his days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. 
The second is Numbers 13 32 and 33, where the Hebrews have seen giants in Canaan, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Nephilim is rendered fallen, or possibly feller, a tyrant or bully. Several English translations rendered the word giants, but of late translators seem to prefer leave it untranslated. The giants translation may have come from the Greek Old Testament where Nephilim was gigants which looks like giant but in modern Greek would be titans. In Greek mythos, the titans were the supernaturally powerful offspring of gods and humans. Some biblical researchers contend that the sons of God were fallen angels who mated with human females and slash or possessed human males and then mated with human females. These unions resulted in offspring, the Nephilim, that were heroes of old, men of renown it is also most important to note that they are mentioned almost simultaneous to God's statement that he would destroy the earth by flood, and it seems from this association that their effect upon mankind was one of the primary justifications that brought the destruction. I read a commentary that stated that if this were fact, that the Nephilim had mated with a variety of species, then we would now have a variety non-humans among us. Each has their own special traits. One example is vampires. They were created when Nephilim fused their DNA with vampire bats. Vampire bats come out at night when the sunlight is dim as sun hurts their eyes. Like the vampire bat, human vampires are adversely affected by sunlight and crave blood. Many true vampires, crave blood from the time of their birth. Many have donors that give blood to them and keep them well supplied. Blood often restores them to full health and well-being. Another example given was reptilians, that are non-humans that can shapeshift. This means that they can alter their DNA electrically to transform from a human form to one that is reptilian. They have to concentrate to keep their human shape, if not they turn into reptilian humanoid. These were not the only examples given. Some involved malformation, birth defects, races, genetic differences, etc. For this reason, it is understandable why the Nazis made determined efforts to find evidence of Nephi limbs in order to twist the legends to conform with their barbaric beliefs. We have all seen the photos of giant skeletons being unearthed as well as the urban legends told in regards to superhumans. But there was a strange incident that was disclosed a few years ago that just seemed to fade off without any explanation or follow-up. In 2005, there were reports that a giant man was killed in the Afghanistan mountains. This man was described as pale white, 15 foot tall, 1,100 pound, six-fingered and six-toed who was feeding on human parts. It was reported that the giant man was killed by US military after he reportedly attacked by throwing large rocks at them. The corpse of this giant man was flown to Germany for autopsy according to witnesses. Apparently the information was presented on the Coast to Coast AM show and discussed by George Norrie and Steve Quayle. Since that time there has been little mention of this incident. Could this giant man have been a real being and slash or had any relation to a Nephilim? Are there Nephilim living, thriving, and breeding among us? Is there any connection with 2012 and the supposed end times theories? There is a very good page on this subject at Leviathan Chained, the legend of the Nephilim and the Thulhu Mythos. In the H.G. Wells book The Time Traveler, he describes a race of monsters that live in the earth and maintain a secret society that was technologically far more advanced than the surface people. As well, these underground humanoids fed on the surface dwellers. There is a story by a Native American woman who stated her tribe was plagued by giant people that would steal their dead to eat them. They were red-haired and lived in caves. In the end the tribe burned these giants to death. There are many stories in many cultures that refer to colossal beings in their midst. For us, it's simply a matter of what to believe. Just for the record, I think that was the most far-fetched thing I have posted thus far, but we will see. Jiwozona, Female Demon
The Jiwozona is a female swamp demon or evil fairy in Slavic mythology known for being malicious and dangerous. It is also referred to as a Mamuna. These beings supposedly live in thickets near rivers, streams, and lakes. Some say she took the form of an ugly, old woman with a hairy body, long straight hair and breasts so huge that she uses them to wash her clothes. Jiwozona is also be a shapeshifter and can appear as a beautiful nymph capable of luring young men to their death. On her head she sometimes wore a red hat with a fern twig attached to it. It is said that she can lead anyone down the wrong path, literally and figuratively. Jiwozona kidnapped human babies just after birth and replaced them with her own offspring, known as foundlings or changelings. A changeling could be recognized by its uncommon appearance, disproportionate body, often with some kind of disability, as well as an inherent wickedness. It had a huge abdomen, unusually small or large head, a hump, thin arms and legs, a hairy body and long claws. Its behavior was said to be marked by a great spitefulness towards people around it, a fear of its mother, noisiness, reluctance to sleep and exceptional gluttony. They rarely reached adulthood, but if it did, it was disabled and spoke gibberish. Many traditional Slavs thought Jiwozona was a goblin. There were several ways to discourage child abductions but the most prevalent was that mother would tie a red ribbon around a child's hand, put a red hat on its head and shield the face from the light of the moon. The red ribbon around the child's hand is still practiced in Poland today but the meaning behind it is mostly lost to the populace. If the Jiwozona managed to take the infant away, there was still a method to get it back. The mother had to take the changeling to a waste heap, whip it with a birch twig and pour over it water from an eggshell, chanting take yours, give mine back, at which point Jiwozona would fell sorry for her offspring and took it away, returning the child she stole. Women at risk of becoming one of these demons after death were thought to be midwives, old maids, unmarried mothers, pregnant women who die before childbirth, as well as abandoned children born out of wedlock. The following is a translated passage from a 18th century Polish narrative that warns of the Jiwozona, translated as surprise wife, it is a midget or giant with scary eyes, big head, with twisted arms, green skin, and long, reaching bottom breasts. At times theses demons are not so frightful but they attack only mothers of illegitimate or non-baptized children. They cause harm with their breasts, like a flail with precision and determination, that they can even kill with such weapons. One must be careful during contact because they also could switch the children. When mother doesn't care enough for her child, Jiwozona tries to steal her baby and switch with the devil's child. There is however a way to get back a stolen child. The mother has to leave the devil's child so the Jiwozona would be touched by baby's cry and will take him and give back the taken one. It is either a midget or a giant. Certainly weird. Rakshasa, Evil Shapeshifter The Rakshasa are a race of humanoid beings in Hindu and Buddhist mythology. They are seen as a type of goblin or evil spirit. They are not equal in evil traits, but have been classified into four subraces, Akashasar, these Rakshasa have the heads of white tigers and are skinnier than common breed. They are unusually powerful spellcasters and specialize in necromantic magic. To use their necromantic powers to their full potential the Acacias are often use graveyards or old battlefields as their headquarters. When working on one of their dark schemes they often let their undead do the physical work while they stay behind the scenes themselves. Natian, these are shapeshifters with the ability to utilize different supernatural combat styles based on their current forms. Najtharun. Najtharun have the heads of black tigers and are covered in black fur. They have few magical powers but compensate by being strong fighters, specializing in assassination. They lack most Rakshasas need to be the leader of any organization that they are a part of, often working for other Rakshasa. Zakyas. Zakyas resemble standard Rakshasas, but rather than focusing on sorcery, they are skilled melee combatants and weapon masters. They use their weak magical powers to supplement their martial prowess. According to the legend, Rakshasas emerged from Brahma's foot. 
the Vishnu Purana also makes them descendants of Kajyapa and Kaza, a daughter of Daksha, through their son Rakshas, and the Ramayana states that when Brahma created the waters, he formed certain beings to guard them who were called Rakshasas. It is thought that the Rakshasas of the epic poems were the rude barbarian races of India who were subdued by the Aryans. The Rakshasas are described in the Ramayana, the Rakshasas sleeping in the houses were of every shape and form. Some of them disgusted the eye, while some were beautiful to look upon. Some had long arms and frightful shapes, some were very fat and some were very lean, some were mere dwarfs and some were prodigiously tall. Some had only one eye and others only one ear. Some had monstrous bellies, hanging breasts, long projecting teeth, and crooked thighs, whilst others were exceedingly beautiful to behold and clothed in great splendor. Some had two legs, some three legs, and some four legs. Some had the heads of serpents, some the heads of donkeys, some the heads of horses, and some the heads of elephants. Many traditional Hindus believe these creatures are indeed real and that it feeds on human flesh. They are shape changers and magicians, and often appear in the forms of humans, dogs, and large birds. They can make themselves invisible and cannot enter a home without being invited. In the popular lore, Rakshasas are demons and fiends who haunt cemeteries, disturb sacrifices, harass priests, possess and devour human beings, and vex and afflict mankind in all sorts of ways. They are said to drink blood and prefer to attack infants and pregnant women. They usually disturbed the sacrifices, and tortured the priests. Rakshasas are known to carry away beautiful women to whom they were attracted. The Rakshasas, male or female, were ugly in appearance, but they could assume any form they pleased with the powers they possessed. Occasionally they would serve as rank and file soldiers in the service of a warlord. There are epic tales of certain members of the race who rose to prominence, some of them as heroes, most of them as villains. Most weapons don't work against these creatures. But all Rakshasas have a common weakness, that any crossbow blessed by a priest will kill them instantly. In addition there is said that a dagger of pure brass has the ability to slay it. There are several modern depictions of Rakshasas including role-playing games, comic book series and video games. For more detail references go to, Rakshasas in the Mahabharata. The Dark Watchers From about Avila Beach, through San Luis Obispo, and all the way up to Monterey, runs the Santa Lucia Mountains. Lurking within these mountains are the strange and mystifying Dark Watchers. The Dark Watchers, as they have come to be known, are apparently giant human-like phantoms that are only seen at twilight, standing silhouetted against the night sky along the ridges and peaks of the mountain range. When spotted, the beings are usually seen staring off into the open air of the mountain seemingly at nothing in particular before vanishing into thin air occasionally right before the spectator's eyes. Who or what the watchers are, no one knows. Where they came from or why they are there, again lost in speculation. And what they are looking for or watching is beyond anyone's current comprehension. The Chumash Indians first spoke of them in legends and their cave painters drew them in their colorful wall drawings. Later legendary author John Steinbeck described them in his short story, Flight. Pepe looked up to the top of the next dry withered ridge. He saw a dark form against the sky, a man's figure standing on top of a rock, and he glanced away quickly not to appear curious. When a moment later he looked up again, the figure was gone. 1970s Stamp of Robinson Jeffers Also in 1937, the poet Robinson Jeffers mentioned them in his poem Such counsels you gave to me as forms that look human. But certainly are not human. If Jeffers or Steinbeck ever actually saw one of the watchers is unknown, but the local legend has been around since long before they wrote about it. In the mid-sixties, a Monterey Peninsula local who was the past principal of a local high school saw them while hiking in the mountains. He had enough time to study the dark figure, to see its clothing and notice how the figure was strangely studying the mountains. When the principal called out to his fellow hikers, the figure disappeared. Other, 
more recent sightings have included a dark hat and cape in the description of the mountain residing phantoms. Weird California, you travel guide to California's local legends and best kept secrets. The Wendigo The Northwoods of Minnesota While this creature is considered by many to be the creation of horror writer Algernon Blackwood in his classic terror tale, The Wendigo, this wood spirit was, and is, very real to many in the northern woods and prairies of the state. Many legends and stories have circulated over the years about a mysterious creature who was encountered by hunters and campers in the shadowy forests of the upper regions of Minnesota. In one variation of the story, the creature could only be seen if it faced the witness head-on, because it was so thin that it could not be seen from the side. The spirit was said to have a voracious appetite for human flesh and the many forest dwellers who disappeared over the years were said to be victims of the monster. The American Indians had their own tales of the Wendigo, dating back so many years that most who were interviewed could not remember when the story had not been told. The Inuit Indians of the region called the creature by various names, including Wendigo, Wittigo, Wittico, and Witigo, but each of them was roughly translated to mean the evil spirit that devours mankind. Around 1860, a German explorer translated Wendigo to mean cannibal among the tribes along the Great Lakes. Native American versions of the creature spoke of a gigantic spirit, over 15 feet tall, that had once been human but had been transformed into a creature by the use of magic. Though all of the descriptions of the creature vary slightly, the Wendigo is generally said to have glowing eyes, long yellowed fangs and overly long tongues. Most have a sallow, yellowish skin but others are said to be matted with hair. They are tall and lanky and are driven by a horrible hunger. But how would a person grow to become one of this strange creatures? According to the lore, the Wendigo is created whenever a human resorts to cannibalism to survive. In years past, such a practice was possible, although still rare, as many of the tribes and settlers in the region were cut off by the bitter snows and ice of the North Woods. Unfortunately, eating another person to survive was sometimes resorted to and thus, the legend of the Wendigo was created. But how real were, or are, these creatures? Could the legend of the Wendigo have been created merely as a warning against cannibalism? Or could sightings of Bigfoot-type creatures have created the stories? While this is unknown, it is believed that white settlers to the region took the stories seriously. At times, they even took the sightings and reports quite seriously and made it enough of the local culture that stories like those of Algernon Blackwood were penned. Real-life stories were told as well and according to the settlers version of the legend, the Wendigo would often be seen, banshee-like, to signal a death in the community. A Wendigo allegedly made a number of appearances near a town called Rosu in northern Minnesota from the late 1800s through the 1920s. Each time that it was reported, an unexpected death followed and finally, it was seen no more. Even into the last century, Native Americans actively believed in, and searched for, the Wendigo. One of the most famous Wendigo hunters was a Cree Indian named Jack Fiddler. He claimed to kill at least 14 of the creatures in his lifetime, although the last murder resulted in his imprisonment at the age of 87. In October 1907, Fiddler and his son, Joseph, were tried for the murder of a Cree Indian woman. They both pleaded guilty to the crime but defended themselves by stating that the woman had been possessed by the spirit of a Wendigo and was on the verge of transforming into one entirely. According to their defense, she had to be killed before she murdered other members of the tribe. There are still many stories told of Wendigos that have been seen in northern Ontario, near the cave of the Wendigo, and around the town of Kenora, where a creature has been spotted by traders, trackers, and trappers for decades. There are many who still believe that the Wendigo roams the woods and the prairies of northern Minnesota and Canada. Whether it seeks human flesh, or acts as a portent of coming doom, is anyone's guess but before you start to doubt that it exists, remember that the stories and legends of this fearsome creature have been around since before the white man walked on these shores. The legends had to have gotten started somehow, didn't they? Sources and Bibliography Name Two-Face Tribal Affiliation, 
Cheyenne, Sioux, Omaha. Native names, Hestoveto Kioo, Hestovakehi, Hestoveto, Hestovehe, Cheyenne, Anukite, Anagite, Anukite, Anukite, Anukite Win, Winyan Nukpa, Sioux. Also known as, Double Face, Sharp Elbows, Two Faces, Two Faced People, Two Faced One, Two Face, Two Faces, Tufus, Tufuses, Tufus, Double Face, Double Face, Double Faces, Double Faces, Double Faces, Double Face Woman, Double Woman. Type, Monster. Related figures in other tribes, Sharp Elbows, Iowa, Red Woman, Crow, Headless Man, Wichita. Two Face is a malevolent humanoid monster of the Plains Indian tribes. In some tribes two faces are described as ogres, but most often the two face resembles a human except for having a second face on the backside of his or her head. If people make eye contact with this second face, they will either be struck dead or paralyzed with fear until the two face returns to murder them. In some traditions there is only one two face, female in some tribes and male in others, while other traditions suggest a whole race of two faces. The misdeeds of Two-Face range from murdering and mutilating people, to cannibalism, to kidnapping or even just frightening misbehaving children. In some Sioux legends, Double-Face Woman is to blame for childhood fits and night terrors. In Omaha mythology, it is a Two-Face who kills the pregnant mother of the twin heroes. The Cherokee Legend of Uktina Long ago, Halahiojajezv, when the sun became angry at the people on earth and sent a sickness to destroy them, the little men changed a man into a monster snake, which they called Uktina, the keen-eyed, and sent him to kill her, the sun. He failed to do the work, and the rattlesnake had to be sent instead, which made the Uktina so jealous and angry that the people were afraid of him and had him taken up to Galunlatai, to stay with the other dangerous things. He left others behind him, though, nearly as large and dangerous as himself, and they hide now in deep pools in the river and about lonely passes in the high mountains, the places the Cherokees call where the Uktina stays. Those who know say the Uktina is a great snake, as large around as a tree trunk, with horns on its head, and a bright blazing crest like a diamond on its forehead, and scales glowing like sparks of fire. It has rings or spots of color along its whole length, and can not be wounded except by shooting in the seventh spot from the head, because under this spot are its heart and its life. The blazing diamond is called Alunciuti transparent and he who can win it may become the greatest wonder worker of the tribe. But it is worth a man's life to attempt it, for whoever is seen by the Uktina is so dazed by the bright light that he runs toward the snake instead of trying to escape. Even to see the Uktina asleep is death, not to the hunter himself, but to his family. Of all the daring warriors who have started out in search of the Alunciuti only Aganunitsi ever came back successful. The East Cherokee still keep the one that he brought. It is a large transparent crystal, nearly the shape of a cartridge bullet, with a blood red streak running throughout the center from top to bottom. The owner keeps it wrapped in a whole deer skin, inside an earthen jar hidden away in a secret cave in the mountains. Every seven days he feeds it with the blood of small game, rubbing the blood all over the crystal as soon as the animal has been killed. Twice a year it must have the blood of a deer or other large animal. Should he forget to feed it at the proper time it would come out of its cave in a shape of fire and fly through the air to slake its thirst with the lifeblood of the conjurer or some one of his people. He may save himself from this danger by telling it, when he puts it away, that he will not need it again for a long time. It will then go quietly to sleep and feel no hunger until it is again brought forth to be consulted. Then it must be fed again with blood before it is used. No white man must ever see it and no person but the owner will venture near it for fear of sudden death. Even the conjurer who keeps it is afraid of it, and changes its hiding place every once in a while so it can not learn the way out. When he dies it will be buried with him. Otherwise it will come out of its cave, like a blazing star, to search for his grave, night after night for seven years, when, if still not able to find him, it will go back to sleep forever where he has placed it. Whoever owns the Alunciuti is sure of success in hunting, love, rainmaking, and every other business, 
but its great use is in life prophecy. When it is consulted for this purpose the future is seen mirrored in the clear crystal as a tree is reflected in the quiet stream below it, and the conjurer knows whether the sick man will recover, whether the warrior will return from battle, or whether the youth will live to be old. From Myths of the Cherokee by James Mooney, 19th Annual Report of the Bureau of American Ethnology Name, Flying Head Also known as, Whirlwind, Big Head Tribal Affiliation, Iroquois, Wyandot Native Names, Canon Sistentis Kunanrayanan, Quenanrayanan, Koniranana, Unanrayanan, Kaoniranana, Aroniraoyeni, Dagwanoyant, Dagwanoyant, Dagwanoyant Gawa, Doctanoyant, Dagwanoyant Type, Monster, Undead Creature Related Figures in Other Tribes, Rolling Head, Plains Tribes Flying heads are undead monsters from the legends of the Iroquois tribes. The flying head appears as a huge, disembodied head with fiery eyes and long, tangled hair. They fly through the air, pursuing humans to chase and devour. The origins of flying heads vary greatly from story to story. In some tales, a flying head is created from a violent murder scene the severed head of a victim grows to enormous size, or the head emerges from a mass grave. In others, a human is transformed into a flying head after committing an act of cannibalism. In many stories, the origin of flying heads is not remarked on at all they are primordial monsters whose nature is to eat humans, but occasionally have other motivations of their own. Flying heads are associated with whirlwinds in many Iroquois communities. Names such as Canon Sistentis and Kunin Rayanin mean flying head, while names such as Dagwanoniant literally mean whirlwind. The Origin of Bats The Iazi family was a large family. They lived in a camp. Very often they used to go picking berries, for their country was a rocky country where berries abounded. Very often some of the berry pickers would get lost and never be found again. It was thought that some creature made a prey of them and ate them. One time one of the Iazi men was traveling. On his way he came across a kind of cabin of rock, from the top of which smoke was rising and in front of which a number of human skulls hung in the opening. Now this Iazi managed to enter. By being very careful and not touching the skulls, he gained the inside of the rock house without making any noise. These skulls were put there to rattle when anybody tried to pass. When Iazi got inside, he he beheld two old blind women. As soon as they became aware of his presence, one of them said, we had better begin to cook something and we will find out if Iazi is passing here. Now these old women had some grease in a bark dish and one of them put some of the grease in a cooking pail. When she did this, Iazi pulled it out with his hand and ate it. Then she took the spoon to taste her grease, but found it gone. So she put another lump in the dish. Iazi took this, and when she started to dip it in it too, was gone. This happened three or four times. At last the old woman said, Iazi must have passed, somebody told us that Iazi was going to pass. He must have passed now then she took a stick which she used to poke the fire with and began feeling all around, poking in the corners of the wigwam to find if Iazi were there. Every time she came near poking him, he moved to another part of the wigwam, so she could not reach him. Pretty soon she touched him with the poker and then he took off his coat of fisher skin which he was wearing and threw it into a doorway. The old women jumped up and when they felt the fur coat they thought it was Iazi trying to escape through the door. Now these old women had a sharp pointed bone at each elbow. With this pointed bone they began stabbing the fur coat in their haste to kill Iazi, and pretty soon in their blind fury they fell stabbing each other, each one thinking she was stabbing Iazi. They killed each other. One of the old women said before she died, I believe you hit me by mistake. It was too late, they both died. Now Iazi in the wigwam sat down and looked at them a long time. Then he dragged them outside and looked at them a long time. All around the wigwam he saw the men's and women's bones, the bones of the victims of his two old blind women. Then he knew that all of his lost people had been killed by the old women and eaten. They were cannibals in the shape of monster bats, 
large enough to kill and eat people. Then Iazi took their bodies and cut them up into small pieces. Then he threw them into the air and they sailed off, transformed into small bats as we see them today. Name, Big Owl. Tribal Affiliation, Apache. Also known as, Giant, Owl Man, Old Man Big Owl, Big Owl Witch, Owl Man Giant, Owl Man Monster, Big Owl, Big Owl Man, Big Owl Monster. Type, Giant, Antagonist, Owl. Big Owl is a malicious and dangerous giant often used as a bogeyman in children's stories. In some Apache tribes, Big Owl also plays a more important mythological role as an early adversary of the War Twins. Like other legendary Apache beings, Big Owl is sometimes described as having human form, in this case a man-eating ogre, and other times animal form, in this case a horned owl large enough to carry off a child. Apache legend speaks of Big Owl, a man-eating ogre that often functions as a bogeyman figure in children's stories. More recently, eyewitnesses from southern Texas and Mexico have reported an owl monster called La Lechuza, which is often seen in connection with deaths and unusual, unexplained events. The Lechuza legend is as alive as ever today. Residents along the Texas-Mexico border still report seeing the ominous owls before car trouble or other strange, unexplained events. Legend has it that the Lechuza is really a witch or the spirit of an annoyed woman who can choose to turn into an owl at will. Legend of Lechuza possibly seen in Carrizo Springs. The legend of the Lechuza has been told in this area for years. Now, a recent picture has sparked a discussion about whether the picture is real. The picture believed to have been taken in Carrizo Springs shows two men holding a white owl with a very large wingspan. Our Lauren Kendrick has more in our top story. The picture has definitely got people interested whether or not they believe in the myth. We spoke to one of the owners of Petland who tells us this picture has her baffled when it comes to classifying the type of owl. I think people would like to believe it's real just like they'd like to believe Bigfoot's real and the Loch Ness Monster and all the other creatures. Owner of Petland Laredo, Laura Hatton, gives us her take on the picture that's been circulating social networking sites for the past few days. The picture was taken in Carrizo Springs. Many people are calling the big white bird Lechuza from the urban legend commonly told in the Mexican heritage where the spirit of a woman or a witch turns into an owl. Those wives' tales are there for a reason. They are a legend. Perhaps there at one time was a much larger species of an owl that was here. Hatton says it looks like a barn owl but is way too large. She says it's really hard to determine the exact species by the undercarriage. By looking at the picture, she says it's hard to tell if it is indeed real or fake. The head is really out of focus so it makes you wonder about Photoshop but the wings itself look like a barn owl. One thing Hatton says doesn't add up is the size of the bird. The size doesn't make any sense for the species of an owl because even the largest, a great horned owl doesn't look anything like it and it's still way smaller. Just like other legends in South Texas like the Chupacabra, there's no way of telling if this is a real lechuza or not. I think they'd like it to be the Lechuza because I find the culture here to be full of mysticism and people enjoy it. Pro 8 News Chicano Folklore, a guide to the folk tales, traditions, rituals, and religious practices of Mexican Americans. Zulama and the Witch Owl slash Zulama y la Bruja Lechuza. Name, Cannibal Dwarves. Tribal Affiliation, Arapaho, Grovantra, Cheyenne. Native Names, Hesiadiahii, Arapaho, Vostanahisano, Cheyenne. Alternate spellings, Hansisiadiahii, Hashasidiahii, Siziadiahii, Hajastaho, Hankasiitihiian, Hakasahi. Pronunciation, in Arapaho, Hiachasiitahi, the first syllable rhymes with ye. In Cheyenne, similar to Voshtana Hesono. Also known as, Enemy Dwarves. Type, Native American Little People, Antagonists. Related figures in other tribes, Namarigar, Shoshone, Awakil, Crow, Yaquaji, Wampanoag. 
Although benign races of small magical creatures exist in many Native American tribes, the little people of the Arapahoes and neighboring tribes also known as cannibal dwarves or enemy dwarves are dangerous man-eaters and particular enemies of the Arapaho tribe. Their Arapaho name, Hesiatiahii, literally means little people. Taihiayan comes from the Arapaho word for strong dash Arapaho dwarves are said to have superhuman strength. In some texts they are referred to as Namaragar instead, which is a name borrowed from the neighboring Shoshone tribe, who had similar legends about ferocious little people. Descriptions of the cannibal dwarves vary somewhat from community to community, but they are usually said to be the size of children, dark-skinned, and extremely aggressive. Some storytellers say that they had the power to turn themselves invisible, while others say they were hard to spot simply because they moved with incredible speed. Some suggest that the dwarves' warlike temperament comes because they must be killed in battle to reach the dwarf afterworld. Others believe that they were gluttons who habitually killed more than they could eat just because they could. According to most versions of the story, the race of cannibal dwarves was destroyed in an ancient war with the Arapahoes and other allied Native American tribes. Cannibal dwarves have a long oral history among the Arapaho, Gro Venture, and Cheyenne nations. Legends report that these little people are bloodthirsty, child-sized creatures. Also known as Taihiayan, which means strong in the Arapaho language, cannibal dwarves surprisingly fierce fighters who are fast enough to outrun an Arapaho warrior. While cannibal dwarves might be insanely fast and strong, they're also a bit dense. According to one story published in the Handbook of Native Mythology, a warrior was captured by a cannibal dwarf, so to delay the inevitable, he tried to strike up a conversation. Noticing dwarf hearts hanging on the walls around him, the warrior asked what the gruesome organs were. The dwarf told him that they were the hearts of his relatives, who were out hunting at the time. The warrior then pierced the hearts one by one. The dwarf wasn't sharp enough to realize that piercing those hearts would kill his family. With a final stroke, the warrior pierced the heart of the dwarf who was holding him captive last, and the dwarf who wanted to eat him immediately dropped dead. Tokolashi, African Vampire In the Zulu culture, Tokolashi, Tokoloshi, or Hili is a dwarf-like in stature and are considered a mischievous and evil spirit, a cross between a zombie, poltergeist, and a gremlin. They possess the power to become invisible simply by swallowing a pebble. The lore of the Tekolashi varies depending on the region, but most are fairly consistent in the nature of the Tekolashi. The Tokoloshi, according to a Zulu shaman, has been known to take on many firmis one form is like the description above, but others have portrayed the Tokoloshi as being a bear-like humanoid being. Now, then, the last creature, sir, a creature which is so well known in South Africa, mostly Durban, and elsewhere in Africa, that if you mention its name, people smile because they know that the Tyrese and Jamal are champions. It is called a Tokoloshi. Every African knows what a Tokoloshi is. Some call it Tokoloshi. It looks like a very nasty looking teddy bear in appearance, in that its head is like that of a teddy bear, but it has got a thick, sharp, bony ridge on top of its head. Tokoloshis have a hole in their head. They are also immensely strong. The ridge goes from above its forehead to the back of its head, and with this ridge it can knock down an ox by butting it with its head. Other Zulu sources have described Tokolashi as a bear-like being, similar to the Sasquatch creatures of America and Asia in general appearance. One source states that Tokolashis are created from dead bodies by shamans, if the shaman has been offending by someone. According to the book, the creatures are only the size of small children, but can create terrible destruction, and only the person who is cursed will be able to see the Tokoloshi. In addition, the book says the Tokoloshi may also choose to wander, causing mischief, particularly to children. Other details include its gremlin-like appearance. A skull hole created by a red-hot metal rod, heat plays a vital role in Zulu magic and gouged out eyes some Zulu people are still superstitious when it comes to things like the supposedly fictional Tokoloshi, a hairy creature created by a wizard to harm his enemies, 
also been known to rape women and bite off sleeping people's toes. According to legend, those who see a tokoloshi must never tell a soul, or the creature will return seeking retribution. The tokoloshi is also known for its ravenous sexual appetite, so most of its victims are women. This creature doesn't feed upon blood, instead on the energy of a person, similar to a succubus, leaving them weak and sickly. If the tokoloshi feeds too often on a single person it can result in the victim's death. When it needs to feed, the tokoloshi will approach a village woman at any time of the day in human form. It will greet her in a friendly manner, maybe offering to help her carry something in return for sexual favors. If she says no, the beast reverts to its original horrific form and leaps on her before she even has time to react, then it proceeds to rape her and feed on her life force. This one seems a bit silly, but then again, what doesn't? Beware the Snallygaster. The Blue Ridge Mountains area was settled by German immigrants beginning in the 1730s. Early accounts describe the community being terrorized by a monster called a Schneller Geist, meaning quick spirit in German. It has been suggested the legend was resurrected in the 19th century to frighten freed slaves. Reports of a strange flying beast known as the Snallygaster first appeared in Frederick County in early February, 1909. The story was carried prominently in Middletown's Valley Register, a weekly newspaper, for about a month, when the story mysteriously died. Image limit has been reached BTW, so I will have to start a new thread for included pics, though I'm not sure how important that is to anyone, except to attract attention to the stories. In the early issues, the flying beasts seemed to be everywhere at once, New Jersey, West Virginia, Ohio, and headed this way. It was reported to have created quite a stir in New Jersey, where its footprints were first discovered in the snow. The first person to see it, James Harding, described it as having enormous wings, a long sharp beak, claws like steel, and one eye in the middle of its forehead. He said it made shrill screeching noises and looked like a cross between a tiger and a vampire. A vampire may have been a good description, for it was reported to have killed a man, Bill Gifferson, by piercing his neck with its sharp bill and slowly sucking his blood. It was also seen in West Virginia, where it almost caught a woman near Scrabble, roosted in Alex Crow's barn, and laid an egg near Sharpsburg, where it was reported some men had rigged up an incubator to try to hatch it. T.C. Harbaugh, of Castown, Ohio, wrote a letter to the Valley Register in early 1909, telling of a strange beast that flew over his area making terrible screeching noises. Harbaugh described it as having two huge wings, a large horny head, and a tail 20 feet long. He said it looked as though it was headed this way. Sure enough, the Snallygaster was first sighted in Maryland by a man who fired a brick-burning kill near Cumberland. The strange beast was seen cooling its wings over the outlet of the kill. When the beast's sleep was disturbed by the man, it emitted a blood-curdling scream and angrily flew away. It was also shot at near Hagerstown, sighted south of Middletown at Lover's Leap, and seen flying over the mountains between Gapland and Bucketsville, where it was reported to have laid another egg. Big enough to hatch an elephant. Sightings of the Snallygaster were creating such a commotion that at one point it was reported that President Theodore Roosevelt might postpone a trip to Europe so that he could lead an expedition to capture it. Apparently the Smithsonian Institute was also interested in the beast. From the description provided by a sighting at Shepherdstown, West Virginia, they determined the strange beast was a Snallygaster. The last sighting in Frederick County in 1909 occurred near Emmitsburg in early March. Three men fought the terrible creature outside a railroad station for nearly an hour and a half before chasing it into the woods of Carroll County. Twenty-three years passed before the Snallygaster appeared again in Frederick County. First reports were received from just below South Mountain in Washington County. Eyewitness accounts claimed that it flew toward them from the Middletown Valley. The beast was often seen flying back and forth over the area and was described as being as large as a dirigible, with arms resembling the tentacles of an octopus. The creature appeared to be able to change its size, shape, and color at will. 
Although the creature made no attempt to harm any of the residents of the valley, most people sought the safety of their homes as it flew overhead. All descriptions seem to indicate it was the Snallygaster, last reported in these parts on March 5, 1909. As the life expectancy of a Snallygaster is only about 20 years, the most logical explanation seemed to be that the latest sighting was the offspring of the 1909 creature, possibly hatched from one of the eggs laid near Bucketsville. Since the Snallygaster appears so rarely, the Middletown Valley Register requested that local residents citing the creature provide as accurate and detailed a description as possible for scientific purposes. Two such residents, Charles F. Martin and Edward M. L. Leiter, were able to provide the necessary information. While driving a truck on the National Pike just east of Braddock Heights, they spotted the Snallygaster flying about 25 feet overhead. They thoroughly confirmed the descriptions published the previous week. The Snallygaster finally met his end in a way some might envy. The creature was flying near Frog Hollow in Washington County when it was attracted by the aroma of a 2,500-gallon vat of moonshine. As the beast flew overhead, it was overcome by the fumes and dropped into the boiling mash. A short time later, revenue agents George Dansforth and Charles Kushwa arrived on the scene. They had received information about the still, but were rather startled at the sight of the dead monster in the vat. The two agents exploded 500 pounds of dynamite under the still, destroying the remains of the Snallygaster and John Barleycorn's workshop. A great deal has been written about the Snallygaster since 1909. It has appeared in countless articles in the Middletown Valley Register, Frederick News Post, and other area newspapers. Is has also appeared in the Baltimore Sun, National Geographic, and Time magazine. In 1976, the Washington Post sponsored an unsuccessful search for the Snallygaster, as well as other strange Maryland creatures. Snallygaster, German Schnellgeist, a Pennsylvania Dutch term meaning quick spirit or fast spirit often associated with those strange drafts that slam doors, topple over lightweight objects, or scatter papers. The visual or physical appearance of the Snallygaster is confusing since there are several variation narratives, some having roots in the dragon lore of the early settlers. Thus, the Snallygaster more often has similarities to dragons, green and scaled, and winged. Tales exist around the South Mountain region where the Snallygaster is a monstrous bird preying on young children. Literary accounts of the Snallygaster were printed in the local newspapers. These narratives were most likely invented tales by two rival editors. To end the rivalry caused the Snallygaster demise, sent plummeting headlong into a boiling vat of whiskey. Such a just end for this unseen spirit. Of interest to scholars is the nature of the various tales likely invented, those which were patterned after dragon lore, the absence of Native American influence, and its connection to Pennsylvania Dutch lore. Note, even though the Snallygaster is said to be the Maryland monster you rarely hear much about it, though there have been a few hunts conducted within the Patapsco and Cunningham Falls state parks in recent years. I even heard that a Snallygaster den was located near Camp David at one time. Believe what you may. Sources <laughs>